Item Number SCP-043 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-043 requires no special containment, although it is recommended that SCP-043 not be used for purposes other than testing. A turntable is to be maintained in the same room for testing. Description. SCP-043 appears to be a vinyl copy of The White Album by The Beatles. However, upon closer inspection, the record has no grooves. In spite of this, the record will play from start to finish, regardless of the starting position of the needle. When the 29th track is reached, instead of playing Revolution 9, the disc stops spinning and faint breathing can be heard. Occasionally, the entity responsible for the breathing will speak in a male voice. The entity will respond to questions and show a profound encyclopedic knowledge of the music industry, musical theory, and obscure trivia about many bands and artists. However, the entity refuses to answer questions regarding the Beatles or its own personal details. Inside the jacket, a small handwritten note was found, reading, Limited Edition 1-1 Thanks John XXX Item Number SCP-373 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-373 is to be kept in a containment locker at Site-38. Research into SCP-373 and SCP-373-A iterations is to be carried out by authorized personnel. Grounds for immediate revocations of testing privileges include, but are not limited to, recent loss of loved ones, testing privileges suspended for five years, any history of abuse or inability to follow orders as per containment procedures for other SCPs, testing privileges revoked permanently, any past association with paranormal research or investigative groups, testing privileges revoked until approval given by Site Director, or any unusual or persistent interest or obsession with SCP-373, testing privileges revoked permanently. Note from Head Researcher the potential implications of this device for both SCP-373-A entities and their former loved ones require a certain degree of composure with regards to its use. Quite frankly, we may be creating these beings rather than channeling them. Personnel unable to react responsibly with that degree of power are not to be allowed access. Note from Head Researcher Testing suspended until further notice. See Addendum 373-3 Testing with D-Class personnel to be carried out, as per Addendum 373-4. For maximum efficiency in gathering intelligence regarding SCP-373-A entities, all records used with SCP-373 should be 33.5 RPM vinyl albums with lyric-heavy songs or spoken word tracks. Audiobooks, comedy albums, and other principally speech-based records are encouraged. Principally instrumental or orchestral music is forbidden. SCP-373 is an antique disc phonograph player. Markings on the machine indicate it was built in 1920- An additional label indicates that the device was modified in late 1940- at a facility called Laboratories Inc. The device is composed of a crank-operated turntable, embedded in a wooden case, a tone arm with an aluminum stylus, and a slightly tarnished silver horn. SCP-373 appears to have the ability to modify the audio of any record played on it according to particular patterns. Specifically, research has demonstrated that approximately every fourth word or phrase will be altered from the originally recorded song or monologue. These new words can be organized sequentially to reveal what appears to be messages or statements from a series of unknown entities. 
These entities have been named SCP-373-AX, with X to be replaced with a numerical identification, as entities are discovered. The entity is able to communicate for the duration of each instance of the playing of the record. Upon the next playing of the same record, the same entity will begin speaking, but will not claim not to recall the previous conversation. Due to the stilted nature of the communication, it is rare for the entities to communicate any significant amount of information to Foundation researchers before the end of the record. However, research has demonstrated that two-way communication is possible by lifting the needle from the record while it spins and speaking into the horn. Any attempt at useful communication requires both parties speak while the record spins at the speed at which optimal playback was intended. All SCP-373-A entities report that speaking into the horn with the record slowed or stopped results in a high-pitched squeal for the entity, and vice versa. Testing with anomalies such as SCP-043 and SCP-1668 did not initially produce data. However, analysis of audio taken during testing has shown the presence of at least two distinct breathing patterns being broadcast from SCP-373. Further scheduled testing is currently under consideration. Addendum 373-1 Abridged Log of SCP-373-A Entities Entity SCP-373-A-3 Run Through Number 1 Record Painkiller by Judas Priest Notes An early attempt at scientific analysis of the phenomenon, both the choice of music and questions were largely arbitrary. Two-way communication not yet understood. Full lyrical output is included below to demonstrate effect. All future entries will include only relevant utterances. Results. Playing of Track 1, Painkiller, resulted in the following lyrical output. Faster than a hello. Terrifying scream. Enraged hello full of anger. Who's half man and their machine. Rides the metal can. Breathing smoke in anybody. Closing in with here soaring high. He is me, Painkiller. This is is Painkiller. Planets devastated. Mankind's this its knees. A savior what from out the skies. Hell answer to there is. Through boiling clouds I thunder. Blasting bolts don't steal. Evil's going under no wheels. He is what painkiller. This is I've painkiller. Faster than a dun bullet. Louder than and please bomb. Chromium plated its metal. Brighter than a so suns, flying high on dark, stronger free and and, never more encaptured. Cold been brought back here the grave. Entity SCP-373-83, run through eight. Record: Painkiller by Judas Priest. Notes: First consistent and notable demonstration of two-way communicative potential. Communication redacted the relevant utterances for convenience. Result, the following interview was carried out by researcher Kim with Entity SCP-373-A3. Kim, speaking as record begins, needle up. Hello, please try to stay calm. You've had an accident and we are working to save you. Can you tell us your name? Hello, oh, thank goodness, I thought I had died. Could you please tell us your name? My name is Mary Turner. I had a dream. I thought they hanged. You're okay, Mary. Can you tell me what you see? All dark. No light. Just your voice. Please help. We're very close to getting you out. Just hold on tight. Can you tell me where you live and what day it is? Valdosta, in Balsam County. Is my baby okay? It's fine, ma'am. Can you tell me what year it is? What you mean? It's 1918. The recording ends. Flipping the record results in the conversation beginning again, as in all other tests. Entity Number SCP-373-A24 Run-Through 2 
Record Item N2 Notes Item N2 is a vinyl record pressed by Site-38 for testing purposes, consisting of a rapid, though clearly audible reading of Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities. The speed at which the book is read allows for approximately 720 words per minute, increasing the potential conversational ability of the ensuing SCP-373-A entity. Result. The following is the interview between Researcher Kim and SCP-373-A24. Hello, there's been an accident. We're trying to get you out, but you need to remain calm. Can you tell us what the last thing is that you remember? Harry, is that you? I'm sorry, I can't understand you. What is the last thing you were doing? Harry, it's me. It's Susan. The car skidded on the ice. Where are you? Wait, Susan? Susan? Oh my god, Susan! Are you in here? Harry, we can't tell them. That's her, Joey! That's my wife in there! Sweetie, it's me! Oh god. You've been gone for almost a year, but you're back now. Security. We need security in here. He's losing it. Attempts to restrain Researcher Kim. Kim, knocking down Lucas, grabbing SCP-373's horn, shaking. I'm going to get you out of there. Just wait. Several agents enter the room and drag Researcher Kim out by force, knocking SCP-373 to the ground in the process. Experiment ends. Damage to SCP-373 repaired. Researcher Lucas's injuries were treated. Researcher Kim's attack against Foundation agents attempting to restrain him led to his termination. Addendum 373-2 SCP-373 entities have been showing a greater tendency to present themselves as relatives or close friends of Foundation personnel in the last two months. This has begun to take place in spite of deliberate efforts to choose records at random. Statistical probability suggests it to be highly unlikely that we have been selecting these particular individuals without some influence on the part of SCP-373. Requesting a halt to testing until a pattern can be discerned. Researcher Lucas Addendum 373-3 Request approved. Head Researcher Addendum 373-4 Four different researchers have been caught over the last three weeks attempting to access SCP-373 for personal purposes. In one instance, a researcher successfully began to use a record already believed to contain one SCP-373-A entity, at which point he was able to communicate with his deceased daughter. Present opinion among Site-38 Command is that SCP-373 is deliberately manipulating its users into emotional distress. Additionally, given the disregard for security protocols being shown now by experienced Foundation researchers in the face of SCP-373, we are forced to conclude that the object becomes increasingly determined to force individuals to use it as time passes between usage, much in the way predators become increasingly desperate as time passes after feeding. Suggesting that D-Class personnel be allowed to use SCP-373 twice weekly in order to prevent further deterioration of conditions here. Researcher Lucas Addendum 373-5 Request approved. Head Researcher Item number SCP-543 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures Access to SCP-543 is restricted to staff with Level 2 clearance. Detailed observation of SCP-543 has thus far been restricted to Class D personnel. SCP-543 is a collection of 4-hour VHS videotapes from various manufacturers. Total length of tape is Hours. Tapes are labeled with dates and times from to All tapes viewed so far appear to be noise or snow recorded from an empty analog television channel. 
However, those who watched the tapes for long enough are able to discern an image. See Addenda 543-1 and 543-2. Discovery SCP-543 was found in a single-room apartment in the building on The room contained a brand 38.1 cm analog television set with rabbit ear set top antenna. Television was tuned to the gap between local stations and Antenna was attached to a tangle of wires that filled the entire room from floor to ceiling, except for a small area in front of the television. SCP-543 was stacked along the walls and strewn on the floor. In front of the television was the apartment's tenant, adult male, deceased. Head was buried in the television. He had ran it through the glass screen himself and died of electrocution. Signs of extreme malnutrition. Evidently, after filling the room with wires, he was unable or unwilling to remove any, confining himself to a smaller and smaller space. Body surrounded by food wrappers and excrement. Body was discovered by building's landlord after continued non-payment of rent. Police dismantled antenna structure to retrieve the body. Examination of crime scene photos and investigation of behavior show the wires were placed in four stages over the days before his death. Stage 1 Coat hangers attached to antenna with scotch tape. Hours of VHS tape. Stage 2 Reel of 6-gauge wire and duct tape purchased from local hardware store. Hours of tape. Stage 3 Waste wire scavenged from construction sites. Had lost his job at due to persistent absenteeism. Hours of tape. Stage 4 Apartment ransacked. Springs removed from mattress. Appliances dismantled for wiring. Exits blocked. One tape unlabeled found in the VCR by police. Addendum 543-1 Summary of SCP-543 Observation Logs D-671 Personnel D-671 was given a random selection of tapes. Hours in total. Viewed in chronological order with VCR and television of the same model as Steel mesh fitted over screen as a precaution. In tapes made during Stage 1, D-671 identified the image as unremarkable TV noise. Later she claimed to discern an image and requested that it be tuned in. In Stage 2 tapes, instead of a two-dimensional wall of snow, D-671 claimed to see a vast, three-dimensional space. She stressed the size of the space, bigger than anything you've seen, bigger than anything ever, beginning a claustrophobic tendencies. D-671 reported Stage 3 tapes as clearer and sharper. She now claimed to see things occupying the immense space. Whether they were animate or indeed whether they were entities or events is unclear. Once again, she emphasized her size, becoming agitated when interviewers did not get it. Severe claustrophobia, anxiety, night terrors. After viewing minutes of the final unlabeled tape, D-671 attempted to remove the mesh over the screen, stripping three fingernails and breaking her nose before being restrained. Currently isolated in four-point restraints. Cooperates with interviewers, but answers are repetitive. See Addendum 543-2 Addendum 543-2 Partial transcript or interview with D-671 10-15 hours Why did you do it? Because here isn't big enough. Not when you've seen in there. Big enough for what? Why do you think the TV can see them? Because they're everywhere. They're all through us. And we're not big enough. And it hurts. Item number SCP-855 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures Four members of security are to be present outside SCP-855's location at all times. No staff are to enter SCP-855 during horror, surreal, action, science fiction, or disaster phases. Any entities attempting to leave SCP-855 during the horror phase are to be dispatched by security staff. 
Any personnel entering SCP-855 during its western phase are to be monitored by security staff for signs of aggression. During all other phases, research staff are free to enter and monitor SCP-855. SCP-855 is the designation given to Lecture Hall located at site. SCP-855 is equipped to seat 100 personnel. One reinforced skylight is present on the ceiling, to allow the entry of natural light. Each month, SCP-855 will redecorate itself and temporarily develop anomalous properties, seemingly themed after genres of film. This continues for the entirety of the month and has taken the form of manifestation of entities, mind-altering effects, hallucinations. Genre Log Month Presumed Genre Effects January Action Reports of explosions came from within SCP-855. Security was called in to investigate, at which point a sports car burst through the doors in the SCP-855, running over one member of security. Personnel later reported a man in a tuxedo firing at them with a pistol from within the vehicle. Vehicle vanished 30 seconds later. February, Detective Noir Researchers within SCP-855 temporarily adopted a pessimistic attitude. Light spectrum appears to be affected, causing all researchers in SCP-855 to turn monochrome. March, Surreal All researchers sent into SCP-855 disappeared without a trace. Mobile Task Force Beta-23 film critics, was sent in for a retrieval mission. One member of Mobile Task Force Beta-23 was recovered 20 days after entry. The rest were declared KIA. Survivor claims that SCP-855 contained a room that stretched on for miles, with things in it. Survivor did not respond to further inquiry regarding the nature of said entities. April Comedy Rate of research accidents surrounding SCP-855 increased by 50%. Multiple personnel reported disembodied laughter. May Western Increased aggression noted in personnel inside SCP-855. Multiple fights break out. After researchers were evacuated, the doors leading into SCP-855 opened independently, at which point a single tumbleweed emerged. June Disaster all personnel evacuated from SCP-855. Analysis of SCP-855 via camera drone shows dangerously high levels of radiation. Large, rat-like creature detected by camera drone. July Gangster Footage camera drone used to monitor SCP-855 showed a large city similar to 1950 Chicago. Every individual on the street appeared to be dressed in the manner of a stereotypical gangster. August Drama Upon entering SCP-855, researchers became highly aggressive and began insulting and arguing with those nearby. September Science Fiction Entry to SCP-855 was strictly forbidden, as sensors indicated no oxygen was present within. October War Sounds of conflict were audible from within SCP-855. Security were called in to prevent a repeat of the action incident. A World War II-era tank subsequently emerged from SCP-855 and fired upon security, killing three of them. Said tank vanished 30 seconds later. November Historical Recording from camera drones sent into SCP-855 showed a portrayal of Rome at the height of the Roman Empire. Further analysis revealed several historical inaccuracies as all individuals were observed to speak clear English, some with obvious accents. December Horror A heavy-set man with a noose around his neck emerged from within SCP-855, wielding a large knife. Personnel killed during partial containment breach. Security later reported that bullets had little effect on the entity.
Item number SCP-895 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-895 is sealed, closed and stored in an isolated underground containment cell, at a depth of approximately 100 meters. No cameras, microphones, or other surveillance equipment may be brought within the 10-meter red zone radius of SCP-895 without express permission from at least two Level 3 personnel. Any on-site personnel exhibiting unusual behavior or signs of psychological trauma are to be screened immediately and removed from the site or terminated as the situation warrants. SCP-895 is an ornate oak coffin recovered from the mortuary by SCP personnel on following reports of unusual footage captured by surveillance equipment installed at that location. When questioned, mortuary staff were unable to determine the source of SCP-895 and how it was transported to the location. Upon attempting to open SCP-895, agents on location found the object empty. However, observers viewing the live camera feed were until further notice. SCP-895 must remain closed at all times. SCP-895 causes disruptions of video and photographic surveillance equipment within 50 meters similar to vivid, disturbing hallucinations, with variable duration and regularity corresponding to the camera's proximity to SCP-895. Within a range of 5 meters from SCP-895, footage captured can cause severe psychological trauma and hysteria in most subjects. These disruptions do not extend to observers physically present within the area. Addendum 895-01 Audio excerpt from the SCP-895 recovery log 341-L Command Team 1, Command All civilians have been detained and evacuated. You are cleared to move in and capture. T-1 Lead Command 1 Lead Roger, we are moving in. T-1 Lead We are inside the lobby. Video feed check. Command Team 1, Command We are receiving. We are seeing blood on the walls. Please confirm. Negative, Command. It's clean in here. Nothing out of the ordinary. It's gone. Team 1, advise possible memetic properties in effect. Copy, Command. Team 1 moving into storage area. We are in the storage area. Object located. Christ, it's moving. Team 1, confirm. Object appears to be alive and moving. Command, uh, negative. We see no movement. Object appears to be normal. 2. Open it up. Sounds of weapons being readied, followed by creaking as object is opened. T1-2. Sir, it's empty. Command, one lead. The object appears to be empty. Command, do you copy? Command, sounds of screaming and retching. Command, do you copy? Shit, we're bugging out. Close that thing. Addendum 895-02 Following incident and the loss of three personnel, the red zone of SCP-895 has been extended from 5 meters to 10 meters, and security personnel shifts have been reduced to 4 hours as a precaution. Item Number SCP-1038 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-1038 is to be kept in a locked storage container within the Site-17 Audio-Visual Department with keypad combination possession of Research Director. Due to the nature of the object's effects, O5 level approval has been granted for SCP-1038's non-experimental, recreational use on a weekly basis for all Site personnel on Fridays from 19.30 to 22.30 hours, using previously tested content. Description. SCP-1038 is an audio-visual cable measuring 6.096 meters in length 
with both ends terminating in three standard RCA connector plugs, color-coded for composite video and stereo audio. There are no markings on the connectors or cable to indicate the manufacturer, or further specifications of the cable. The cable's properties manifest when it is plugged into a television or monitor, and a media player, VCR, DVD, streaming media device, etc. While the device plays the selected content, the television will instead display what can best be described as an alternate reality version. As of November 23, 2011. SCP-1038 has displayed content from distinct realities. Refer to Addendum 1038-B for a brief experiment summary. The means by which this effect is generated is unknown, as tests have shown no anomalous power draws from the connected devices, changes in area radiation, or SCP-1038 appears to exhibit awareness regarding the information being passed through it. Should the selected content not exist in the alternate reality the cable connects to, SCP-1038 will instead play the closest match. A VHS recording of a football game might instead show a gladiatorial fight. At the same time, the object will also only ever show one alternate version for the particular medium. All DVD copies of a film will play the same alternate, which is in turn different from VHS copies of the movie. It is unknown if this is a sign of intelligence, or if the data already exists on the storage media. Addendum 1038-A Recovery Report SCP-1038 came to the attention of the Foundation after an October 3, 1990 incident at Elementary School in Oregon, in which Miss attempted to show a recording of a Cable in the Classroom documentary to her fourth grade class. The recorded documentary was about the Great Pyramid, but the viewed content was During the ensuing arrests, firings, and lawsuits, Foundation agents took custody of the AV equipment used in the incident. Component testing revealed only SCP-1038 showed anomalous properties. Purchase of the cable was not recorded in any district expense reports. Addendum 1038-B Partial Experimentation Log Medium VHS. Content: Schindler's List Results SCP-1038 was plugged not into a television, but a recording device. Recorded output did not deviate in any way from the film. We've run this experiment several times with different players and media, with the same results. We are now confident that the object requires a connection to a TV in order to view the alternate. Dr. Research Director Medium VHS Content: History of the World Part 1 Results A documentary, apparently closely in line with our own history. Due to the thoroughness of the film, Part 1 only covers the dawn of the Neolithic. Test terminated after 92 minutes, when the VHS tape stopped playing. Alternate version was in the middle of a segment explaining Neolithic agriculture. Media DVR recording Device provided by research assistant Content: 2010 NCAA Football National Championship Results Complete football game, but featuring schools A portion of the halftime show reveals that teams were selected using a playoff format. Medium DVD-RW Content: Recording of children playing at Park Confiscated from agent Results Children played around a statue of Plaque on the base calls him the hero of racial purity. Medium Previous test DVD RW from Agent Content Content of previous test overwritten with tourist video of the Washington Monument and Lincoln Memorials. Results Statue of Similar to the one seen in previous test, but approximately 130 meters tall seen in place of Washington Monument. Lincoln Memorial seems to have suffered blast damage and has not yet been repaired. Data overwrite apparently only affects viewed content. Alternate reality content remains unchanged. Medium DVD Content Box set of Seasons 1 and 2 of Sliders Results No changes Results of frame-by-frame -frame analysis pending. Medium DVD-RW Content 
Collection of footage of Earth and our position in the universe. Overlaid with greetings in all known languages. Similar to the golden records carried by the Voyager probes. Result, an apparently similar message, of approximately 2,000 verbal greetings. The only languages recognized are Ugaritic, what is possibly Proto-Minoan, a form of Old Chinese, and Hittite. Further, all individuals seen in the footage appear to be Permission for further communication attempts pending. Item number SCP-1340-RU Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures No methods of anomaly capture and containment have been developed as of yet. Research efforts are currently ongoing. Anomaly witness identification and capture is to be performed according to standard Foundation search protocols. All circumstances of contact with the anomaly are to be ascertained on successful capture. If the first contact with SCP-1340 has been broken prematurely, it is required to perform a second test contact attempt. If the test proves negative, the subject is to be administered Class B amnestics and released, with a week-long period of observation. All other subjects are to undergo comprehensive treatment procedures and be administered Class D amnestics. Should treatment fail, False memories of their personality and a dislike to television technologies should be implanted as per the Second Life Protocol. Such subjects are then to be relocated to closed communes under Foundation control, in particular those lacking access to televisions, where they can be used in covert, safe research experiments amid routine tasks. SCP-1340 is a phenomenon consisting of spontaneous appearances of an image of a human eye on CRT-based TV screens. Said image takes up the majority of the kinescope's visible area. Despite apparent lack of consistency between cases of the phenomenon's appearance, certain patterns have been deduced as intrinsic, such as SCP-1340 appears exclusively in cathode ray tube-based devices, though implementation of this technology may vary, connected to analog television antennas. SCP-1340's period of activity fall between 2300 and 0200 on local time. All registered incidents involving SCP-1340 are localized to the Northern Hemisphere, between 45 degrees and 75 degrees latitude. Each particular registered incident has involved only a single witness, hereafter referred to as Observer. Possibly of concurrent observation at different locations have been confirmed by experiment. As such, the anomaly cannot be contained through observer isolation. General analysis of anomaly witness reports, as well as replicated contact efforts have permitted to pinpoint the course of SCP-1340's activity. During first contact, the anomaly manifests on active television screens that have been showing white noise for extended periods of time. During subsequent contact events, the anomaly is capable of overriding low-quality transmissions. Presence or absence of audio transmission has no effect on contact probability. Upon manifestation, the device begins showing an image of a human eye which takes up the majority of the screen. Said eye is blue and belongs to a man. The image is clear and free of any effects that hamper overall perception of the contents. Analysis of the eye sclera has confirmed that all instances of the anomaly transmit the image of the same man. The eye is always wide open slowed and the frequent blinking is present. The pupil is dilated, and the eye often reacts with delay to the observer's movement, tracking them. If the affected device is audio-enabled, upon manifestation the sound volume will be reduced to 25 decibels and will consist of weak, white noise static, along with intact and fragmented words, distorted and pronounced with apparent difficulty. Should the observer shut off or destroy the device during first contact with SCP-1340, destruction of the kinescope is sufficient in the latter case, the anomaly will no longer manifest in front of that observer. Otherwise, the anomaly will continue manifesting itself on the device every time under the described requirements, even without the observer present. 
Under continued observation, SCP-1340 expands its sphere of influence and begins to appear not only in the location of first contact, but also in other places where the observer is present. It has been noted that in 65% of registered cases during repeated contacts, the anomaly brings into existence an unlimited number of CRT television devices of various kinds and models, exclusively within the locale of first contact, which seems to operate without any apparent power sources. The TVs are placed on the floor, on various furniture present and on each other, and vary in size substantially. During the anomaly's active periods, all devices transmit the same image of SCP-1340, and the anomaly's eye is not able to track the observer, instead chaotically looking from side to side, while the sound's volume, despite a considerable number of additional speakers, increases by only up to 10 decibels. The TV devices are off while the anomaly is inactive. Observers rarely disclose the occasion, and usually consider it a sign of psychological illness. In rare cases, the subject have been able to get rid of SCP-1340's presence through prolonged medical treatment. In addition, the observers develop phobias toward watching television, which prevent further contact with the anomaly. Due to the circumstances above, the Foundation is currently unable to discern the periodicity of manifestations or the overall amount of contact cases. All experiments with SCP-1340 have been classified by the Ethics Committee. The Foundation has successfully recovered several documents that explain the anomaly's appearance from internal GOI archive records. The addendums are available with clearance level 4. Addendums to the SCP-1340 Document Suicide Letter Belonging to January 11, 1969 My name I am an accountant at And this will be my suicide note. I have no relatives or loved ones, so I write to you, prosecutors and officers. I am haunted by hallucinations related to TVs. It must be because of my trauma and several months of coma. It happened first when I fell asleep after the show ended. I woke up to the sound of my cat screaming and saw an enormous eye staring directly at me from the screen. I was half asleep and didn't understand what was going on, but then realized that the broadcast has long since ended. It was about one hour past midnight on the clock. The eye was just staring at me, and then blinked. I screamed, threw something at it, and ran to the bathroom. When I caught my breath and calmed myself enough, I looked back. The eye was still there, and it only turned to stare at me again. I couldn't muster the courage to shut it off, and as such stayed awake in the bathroom, shutting it down when sunrise came and there was only static on the screen. I witnessed that eye time and time again after that. I stopped panicking in front of it and learned to withstand its gaze. At some point I thought it was my own eye. It looked scary, but it didn't want to scare. I brought myself closer to it and tried to hear what it's speaking to me. It was quiet, even on full volume, and I decided to buy another TV for it. Then another. I wanted to hear what it was saying. I wanted to help it. I started stealing and for that I am sincerely sorry. All the money I got that way I spent on traveling around the Soviet cities and buying out old TVs. I have collected 18 in total, different ones, small and big. Maybe that was me hypercompensating for the fear, and maybe my attempts to find the truth are just justifications. I don't know. Every night I closed the blinds to prevent my neighbors from seeing this bright blue light, and listened. It didn't get much louder but I managed to discern some of the words. I didn't understand much, but what I did finally did me in. I'm insane. I've recorded all my stealings on the back side of this note and request to repay them through selling off my car. I will break the TVs. There is no other way. I bequeath my brain to scientific purposes so they can help those like me. I request not to blame anyone for my death. January 11th 1969. Classified. Kravapolov. Research Institute Progress Internal Report. August 14, 1967. 2. Progress Research Institute Director Kovalev VG. From Bureau No. 4 Director, Mind and Consciousness, Kravapolov AC. Per Bureau No. 4's current directives, 
I am informing you of a suggestion to use the developments of the Mind-64 project, the study transmission methods for discrete thought forms and, further on, main cerebrum portion impulse flows through inclusion and info code arrays designed to adapt the technology to television methods of information playback. As you know, the Mind-64 project has advanced significantly since integration of Currently, we are able to record and seamlessly transmit neural impulses, but the Institute still does not possess a suitable storage device for such vast quantities of information. The only currently known storage sufficient for human mind conversation is the Infosphere itself. There are other difficulties as well. Out transmission capabilities significantly outpace our recording capabilities. The speed of processes running within a human brain is too high, far higher than our current speed of impulse recording which means that we cannot adequately record and transmit the full thought form of a person without disrupting its connection and, as such, without degrading their consciousness and memory. Unfortunately, this lag does not allow us to experiment with copying a healthy person's personality. However, the Bureau members have found an alternative method. It has been proposed that we use a comatose source in the experiment. I have taken responsibility and have found a suitable candidate for such a role. Under medical attention in Municipal Hospital No. currently lies patient in a state of coma after a tragic accident. We hereby request your assistance in arranging a classified experiment on transmitting their personality into the infosphere through our Bureau's newest antenna and receiving the resulting signal on the Chukot station. The process will take approximately two hours. Chemical treatments developed by Bureau No. are proposed to be used to slow the brain's activity as much as possible. Yes, we will be unable to halt the cerebral processes completely, but the estimated damage to the consciousness thought form is expected to be minimal. Now onto the practical side of this research project. We expect the Chuchi Peninsula radio station personnel to receive the information of this person in format close to television standards. At this point we can only guess what it will look like and whether such a transmission will bear any significance for further research. In overall, however, I foresee use of this technology applied to being able to transmit a speaker or presenter directly into every house, every particular receiver. The viewers will gain access to actual talk partners competent in various topics, who will be able to convey useful information more concretely to every particular listener. Just imagine, you turn on the TV and the athletic show host does not only show you the exercises and keep count, but also points out mistakes and gives professional advice. Educational shows for children and adults, news reports, sports shows, travel and history documentaries, etc. will grow to a new level, open the path to fully-fledged connection and feedback. I would like to specifically address any possible concerns about the experiment's ethical side. The operations involved will cause no physical consequences or even discomfort to the test subject. All records of this intervention will be kept secret. I would also like to point out the fact that the resulting information model of a human phantom, thought form, or mind mold is not human in the word's common meaning, and exists only as an idea, an information current, which puts it closer to a soulless computer. Bureau No. 4 Director, Mind and Consciousness Kravapalov AC. Transcription of SCP-1340 Speech Pattern Analysis The following transcript has been procured through the Foundation Speech Recognition Software from Registered Occurrences of the Anomaly. The object transmits words and phonemes in a chaotic manner. The following text has been generated based on possible meaning, registered intonation, and other factors, though it remains distorted. Italics denote portions that differ in pronunciation and intonation but that are still considered valid, based on the machine's output. Uppercase text denotes more expressively pronounced phrases. Note that the level of volume remains within the 25 to 35 decibel range. Snow. Whiteness. Flies everywhere. Fly. Into my mouth. Please are blinding sight. Don't know. Can't see anything. Where are they? Alone. Delivering my eyes, eyes, I see light. Shut off the noise, can't stand it, can't hear my thoughts. Where am I? I'm here. I'm... I can't breathe. Help. Flies all around. No. 
now filled with snow in my throat, hands, where I can't see. They carve me, white strings, endless, clotheslines up, down, up, down. Where'd you go? Was there same? White, black world. Is there a ceiling? Is there a floor? I need to go to work. Come back. I didn't feed the cat. Where is he? Who will feed the balance sheet and the bills? Help me. Snow's too loose. I can't stand. Could crawl, swim. It doesn't stick. Where's the light? There's night here. White, blue, black world. A web of strings. At least give me the cat. I forgot how to breathe. Live. Breathe, please live. I hear the vibrations of screams, endless noise, deafening, forever. What are you? I'm not alone. Man, white static man. Where are you? Come back. I can't scream. Start again between strings. There's someone there, too tight. Pry apart like bars of a cage. Can't manage with her arms. Just a look. Just with an eye. I'm so close on the line. Just one eye. Who are you? I feel you. I see. Get me out. That's my cat. Don't be afraid. Wake the owner, my kitty. Help. Wake the owner, my cat. Mouth full of fleas and snow. Help me. Why do I feel we know each other? But I, you could have plucked. Don't leave me. I can't see you. Don't leave me alone. There you are again. I didn't. Don't switch away. It's me, I. I see better now. Can't pull the strings further. Stop flickering. It's me. Why is he there? And I'm here. What are the light boxes? Can't speak. So I'm looking lower. Lips there. Must be there. Read them without end. Vomiting flies. Don't look at me like that. Break the wall, I know. You can see. Help. Where are you writing? Must get out my eyes. Leave at least one. I know you want to kill yourself. Where do I go now? Item number SCP-1592 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures All possible broadcasts of SCP-1592 are to be intercepted and blocked from public viewing. Intercepted broadcasts are to be stored in sight Video Archive Any civilians physically altered by SCP-1592's effects are to be brought into containment immediately and any witnesses to these alterations dose with Class A amnestics. Viewing of SCP-1592 must be authorized by at least three personnel with Level 3 access clearance. SCP-1592 may only be shown to D-Class personnel. SCP-1592 is a television program entitled Paradise Television, which has demonstrated the capability to cause mental and physical abnormalities. It has the general format of a televangelist program, but discusses values and concepts unusual for such a program. The host of SCP-1592 is a middle-aged Caucasian male, who refers to himself as Pastor Harris. SCP-1592 consists of an as-of-yet unknown number of 15-minute broadcasts, all of which show Pastor Harris sitting on an armchair, looking directly at the camera while delivering a sermon. When an individual watches a broadcast of SCP-1592, they will become interested in the values and concepts it discusses, regardless of previous religious or moral orientations. Further viewing of SCP-1592 will result in the individual gradually becoming obsessed with SCP-1592, 
and neglecting other social obligations in order to continue viewing it. Affected individuals will often record broadcasts of SCP-1592 and watch them multiple times. After the affected individual has viewed a number of broadcasts ranging from 20 to 30, physical alteration will begin. This takes place over a period of one to two weeks. If the victim is stopped from watching SCP-1592 during this period, these alterations will cease, but any alterations already caused by SCP-1592 will remain. Initial physical alterations include the growth of additional sensory organs eyes, noses, etc. on various parts of the body, pigment of the skin radically changing in color, alteration of the vocal cords, preventing normal human speech, elongation or shortening of the limbs, fusion of body parts, fingers, toes, etc., growth of non-human extremities, mandibles, pincers, etc. Later physical alterations often involve morphing of the body into non-humanoid forms, usually resulting in immobility. It is unknown if the victim is aware at this point, as none have responded to attempts at communication. Interview Log 1592-1 Interviewer Dr. Interviewed D-20122 Forenote D-20122 had watched 22 videos of SCP-1592 broadcast at the time of the interview. Severe elongation of the left arm and left leg were present. Alterations to the structure of D-20122's mouth resulted in some difficulty speaking. Hello, D-20122. Hello, Doctor. What, what time is it? It's five minutes past six. Why? Nothing. It's just that, that, uh, that usually when we had a test, you know, where I watch the videos and write them and everything, write, write down what they say. I'm sure they can wait a while longer, D-20122. The tapes aren't going anywhere. No, no, no. I need to see him now so I know what he has to say. If you just calm down. We can finish this interview and proceed with the test. How do you feel about your physical alterations? Well, I was I was worried at first, but it's like what Pastor Harris says on the video. It's so we share his pain, isn't it? It still hurts though when my bones change. And why are you so interested in what Pastor Harris is saying? Well, I don't really know what it is about it. It's just right, you know? Like it all feels right. So you are happy with SCP-1592's effects upon you? Very. End interview. Closing statement. D-20122 began final physical alterations one week after this interview. Sermon excerpts. The following are transcribed records of SCP-1592 broadcast by D-Class personnel who were assigned to view them. What is wrong with the generation of today? They don't understand sacrifice. Haven't felt his gaze on their skin. I hope that my viewers understand sacrifice. I pray to him for that every night. For you. For your souls. If you have a pet, it will play its part. You will share his hunger in the coming days, and the pet will sacrifice for you. If you don't have one to sacrifice and suffer for you, worry not, my children. Worry not, for he will provide. I have a message from a faithful child here, from Jenny in Colorado. She watches his word every night, and the carapace is growing. Jenny writes, Pastor Harris, sometimes I scream from the pain he gives me. I cannot feel my legs. Jenny? If I may address you for a moment, what you are feeling is the pain that he too has suffered for us in the black. You are one of the faithful, Jenny, and so you are worthy to take his image. This pain is simply sacrifice, as he has sacrificed for you. Stay strong, Jenny. I have stood in the ashes of society and walked through the bones of dead planets. Have you seen these things? Has he seen fit to grant you these pleasures? Not yet. But the form is changing. Perhaps you slide along the floor like a slug, or drag yourself along the floor as a… 
Soon his eyes will wrinkle in benevolence at you. In faithfulness, you will find reward. In sanctity, you will find his image. He has many faces and many maws, and they look down on you, judging, waiting, loving. Good night. Item number SCP-1733 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures The DVR containing SCP-1733 is to be kept in a secure video archive at site. Playback of SCP-1733 is strictly forbidden unless required for research. Personnel must contact Dr. Gellert for permission to study SCP-1733. Description SCP-1733 is a digital recording of the 2010-2011 NBA season opening game, played at the TD Garden in Boston, Massachusetts on October 26, 2010, between the Boston Celtics and Miami Heat. Agents monitoring social networking sites were alerted to SCP-1733 when Boston native complained in a Facebook thread on October 27 about a technical foul in the third quarter involving players Ray Allen and Chris Bosch that never occurred in the original broadcast. When confronted, uploaded the relevant segment much to the confusion of his derogators. Foundation agents embedded in Facebook's moderator team deleted the thread and procured the IP addresses of all individuals present at the chat at this time to locate and administer Class A amnestics. The Motorola brand DVR containing SCP-1733 was recovered for study. Study of the footage has since revealed the nature of the recording's anomalous properties. Although initially diverging from the original broadcast only negligibly, such as quarter point totals and occurrences of fouls, SCP-1733 has begun to markedly digress from the content of its earlier playbacks. Recorded entities have been observed to retain memory of previous plans, and as such had developed a burgeoning awareness of their existence. It is hypothesized that playbacks impart an unquantifiable measure of cognizance to the entities inhabiting SCP-1733, with consecutive planes greatly expanding recall of previous events. This effect is cumulative and extends to all persons in the arena. Quality of awareness has progressed from reported feelings of intense deja vu by commentator personalities Mike and Tommy to a near eidetic memory of preceding playbacks. However, to note, no entities inside SCP-1733 have ever addressed the viewer directly, or shown awareness that they reside in a digital recording. The individuals in the recording are virtually indistinguishable from their real-life counterparts in talent, behavior, and mannerisms on court. Fans in the crowd also appear to be real human beings in all respects, and Foundation inquiries into the current status of these persons have found nothing of note. For all intents and purposes, recorded entities appear to be the actual individuals but somehow abiding in a digital medium. TD Garden records have put the number of people in attendance on October 26, 2010 at it was initially thought the purpose of SCP-1733 was to depict an infinite number of game outcomes, since players were able to modify offensive and defensive strategies during every playback. By Playback 034, players and coaches became so keenly adapted to the opposing team's playbook that the score remained 0-0 until 334 in the first quarter. As quality of recall was still weak in early stage iterations, Memory of preceding playbacks likely manifested as a vague intuition felt by players, fans, and team personnel alike, interfering with their ability to grasp the full scope of their situation. By Playback 045, however, comprehension of their predicament had reached such a point that players declined to play altogether and assembled with the rest of those in attendance to formulate possible escape plans. It is the conclusion of Foundation researchers that the inhabitants of SCP-1733 are imprisoned in the setting of the recording, as they have been unable to exit by any means. Doors leading out of the arena have not yielded to an estimated force in excess of Newtons. The assembly has also been unable to exit from locker rooms, player facilities, and skyboxes. Waiting for patrons arriving in at scripted points prior to the start of the first quarter has also been unsuccessful. 
individuals leave by where patrons entered, and are then unable to navigate and escape from the adjacent corridors that girdle the main area. Escape attempts have since grown more desperate, and have included failed attempts at constructing makeshift explosives, all-out rioting, the fracturing of the assembly into three opposing factions, and by playback, the ritualistic murder and disembowelment of players in the hopes of appeasing whatever it is that confines them. See Timeline Document 001 for details. However, upon the beginning of a new playback, all persons are returned to their pre-game status unharmed. Researchers have been unable to duplicate the effects of SCP-1733 with other recordings made by the DVR, confirming the device is not the source of SCP-1733's aberrant properties. Due to the distress visited upon inhabitants of SCP-1733, testing has been suspended indefinitely. Partial Timeline Document 001 Playback Number Notable Developments Playback 002 First recorded deviation from recorded broadcast. TD Garden crowd boos the Miami Heat during entrance. Miami Heat forward LeBron James observed to have scowled and shaken his head dismissively at the crowd. Playback 015 Score remains 0-0 for eight consecutive possessions. Fans appear noticeably subdued when displayed on the facility's HD scoreboard screen. Celtics power forward Glenn Davis is able to execute a crucial block late in the fourth quarter on LeBron James he could not complete during the original broadcast, securing the Celtics' lead. Commentators note Glenn Davis' dedication to performing well on both sides of the court in spite of the Big Three's blistering ball movement on offensive plays. A nascent awareness of previously played games have begun to form. Playback 026 First Miami Heat victory 112-85. Crowd becomes aggressive, shouting obscenities and hurling foodstuffs at the Celtics. Color commentator Tom Heinsohn understood the frustration, criticizing the Celtics' coaching staff for becoming so complacent after having, quote, cracked the code of the Miami Heat offense, unquote. As this was the first game together for the Miami Big Three, it is unlikely any coaching personnel would have become so adjusted to an unfamiliar offense in a single game. Playback 027 Commentators Mike and Tommy note a feeling of deja vu during the Heat's grandiose entrance. Crowd remains subdued during key Celtics plays. Celtics emerge to victors, prompting Tom Heinsohn to remark, quote, The Celtics have come a long way winning back the hearts of their fans, unquote. When asked to elaborate by Mike Gorman, Heinsohn could only respond that he felt the team had an embarrassment to atone for, but could not specify further. Playback 044 Teams emerge disoriented and confused. Game is suspended. Majority of time is spent by medical professionals assessing the mental state of players, who remain convinced they had dreamt playing the season opener frequently the previous night. When informed of the situation by team staff, commentators Mike and Tommy affirm the same feeling. Crowd is also afflicted. Recording ends with courtside correspondents interviewing members of the crowd on the nature of their dreams. Playback 045 Players refuse to play. Cameraman, facility personnel, players, commentators, and crowd members gather in the court to appraise the situation. All persons are convinced they are reliving the same game repeatedly. Doors are tested but cannot be budged. Recording closes the crowd begins to fashion makeshift weapons to pry open doors. Last instance of camera being manipulated by the camera crew. All following playbacks are seen through a single static shot of a broadcast view camera. Playback 051 No attempts to exit the building have succeeded. All exits in the arena and adjacent areas remain sealed. A physical altercation in Balcony Section 318 between an inebriated group of college-age males and one older male leaves the older male concussed on the floor and unconscious. At broadcast cameras unable to pick up audible voices on the opposite side of the arena, presumably the dispute occurred over the group of males not assisting with escape plans. First recorded violent incident. Playback 052 The man knocked unconscious in previous playback is returned to previous state unharmed upon the beginning of current recording. The man ambushes and bludgeons one of his attackers to death at the 34 minute 12 second mark. Playback 055 Cognitization has progressed to such a point that the crowd is now able to remember the events of that week, 
as well as friends and family members outside the facility. Attempts to contact outside for help are met with failure. Playback 065 Crowd is unable to exit the facility. Congregation has since dissolved into the following groups and factions. Players, coaches, and all involved team personnel have presumably barricaded themselves in off-screen player facilities. The infirm and parents accompanied by their children have retreated to the northeast corner of the balcony rise and have elected to wait out playbacks as they occur, marking their territory with a Celtics Championship flag draped over Section 320. Individuals henceforth referred to as the Faith Keepers have proselytized to multiple gatherings that they believe being confined to the TD Garden is a punishment for rampant consumerism of the post-industrial world, and have burned offerings of mobile phones, car keys, handbags, and wallets in center court for the past four playbacks. The group comprises Boston churchgoers and a notable portion of adults numbering approximately individuals, however, remain diligent in formulating escape plans. Playback 073 The Faith Keepers grow in number at the previous playback incident, where three males were severely injured by an improvised explosive fastened to an exit door. No damage to the door is visible. Playback 095 Hedonistic displays of sex and violence have sufficiently curbed the efforts of proselytizers. Makeshift curtains are hung around the site of an orgy at Loge 8 at the urging of Section 320 members. Playback 112 Conditions have deteriorated considerably. Individuals left from balcony section in opening 10 minutes of Playback 112. Playback Fate Keepers storm player facilities to retrieve Paul Pierce and LeBron James. The players are ritually sacrificed and their bodies are subsequently displayed on the arena's Jumbotron. The murder of players seems to have no effect on the recording. Playback Proselytizers have begun to call for the sacrifice of children. Adults have formed a wall between Group 320 and the Fate Keepers. Playback First recorded deviation in arena light to a deep red color. Item number SCP-1756 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-1756 is to be kept in a locked safe in the audiovisual wing of Site-73. A television, compatible remote control, and compatible cables and power adapter are to be provided in Room 346 for testing by Researchers Level 2 and higher. All playbacks produced by SCP-1756 are to be filmed and archived for future analysis. A complete video archive of Sisko and Ebert at the movies and its predecessor programs is to be maintained on site for comparison of SCP-1756 recordings to existing episodes. Testing involving SCP objects in optical disc format or any other Foundation-produced recordings shall require approval from the Site Director. Description: SCP-1756 is a Panasonic RV-31K Region 1 DVD player, manufactured in 1999. Serial number SCP-1756 is externally identical to all other DVD players of its model and production date. Internal examination indicates that SCP-1756 has undergone aftermarket modification to allow it to play non-Region 1 DVDs. Attempts to replicate SCP-1756's anomalous properties by similarly modifying standard DVD players of the same type have been unsuccessful. SCP-1756 is capable of accepting and producing its primary effect with all 12cm optical discs regardless of format or region coding, including DVD, HD DVD, Blu-ray, CD-ROM, and DVD-ROM, music CDs, and proprietary optical disc formats used in video game consoles. SCP-1756's anomalous properties manifest when it is powered on and connected to a television, and an optical disc is inserted into the disc tray and played. 
instead of playing the video or audio content encoded on the disc. The television will display a recording, from 6 to 11 minutes in length, appearing to be a segment from the American television program Siskel and Ebert at the Movies. A syndicated weekly television program aired in the U.S. from 1986 to 1999 as a continuation of previous programs featuring Siskel and Ebert beginning in 1975. In all documented cases, the recording resembles the format of the original television show, in which Chicago-based film critics Gene Siskel and Roger Ebert discuss and debate movies currently in theatrical release and offer their individual opinions about whether the film is worth seeing with a thumbs-up or thumbs-down gesture. Examination of the recordings indicates that the set seen therein is identical to the set used by the television series during the 1992-1996 seasons, and that Sisko and Ebert appear to be approximately the same age as they were during the same time period. When the disc inserted is a motion picture that was reviewed on the original series, the content of the review will be identical to the original review featured on the program. When the content of the disc of the movie not featured or released after Sisko and Ebert's death in 1999 and 2013 respectively, is a visual recording uttered in a theatrically released motion picture, such as television shows, news broadcasts, amateur films or home movies, video games, etc., or is not a visual recording at all, an original recording will be produced in which Sisko and Ebert review the material as if it were a theatrically released motion picture. In these reviews, the critics will speak in a manner similar to the tone affected by the critics on the original series, with Sisko often critiquing individual aspects of the content, such as animation, acting, sound quality, etc., and Ebert analyzing the content from a more emotional, collective perspective. SCP-1756 Experiment Log Experiment 1756-1 Date 2000 Content of Disc The Crying Game 1992 Summary of Recording Identical in content to original series review Experiment 1756-3 Date 2000 Content of Disc Blade Runner 1982 Director's Cut Version 1992 Summary of Recording Similar in content to the original series review, except that neither Siskel nor Ebert make any mention of the narration by Harrison Ford, which was featured in the original theatrical release, and omitted from the director's cut. Experiment 1756-7 Date 2000 Content of Disc Brokeback Mountain 2005 Summary of Recording the film receives praise from both critics, with Ebert's comments largely resembling his published 2005 review of the film, and Siskel making note of director Ang Lee's cinematography, and declaring that star Heath Ledger has, quote, a long and promising career ahead of him, unquote. Both critics give the film a thumbs up. Experiment 1756-17 Date 2000 Content of Disc a 1999 episode of At the Movies in which Ebert paid tribute to Gene Siskel following his death that year, including footage from Siskel's memorial service. Summary of Recording While expressing confusion at why the program received a theatrical release, both critics respond favorably, with Siskel describing it as, quote, a somber and bittersweet reminder of one's own mortality, unquote and Ebert humbly praising his own work as executive producer. Both critics agree that the body of Siskel, as seen lying in repose during the memorial service, quote, plays the part better than Lori Goldman, unquote. Actor who appeared in Godzilla, 1998, playing Gene, a character intended by director Roland Emmerich as a parody of Siskel, in retribution for a negative review of Independence Day, 1996. Both critics give the film a thumbs up. Experiment 1756-21 Date 2000 Content of Disc Mass Effect Video Game 2007 Summary of Recording 
The game receives a mixed review, as the critics spend much of the segment arguing about various points and questioning whether they watched the same movie. Siskel states that the protagonist, Commander Shepard, who he identifies as being played by Mark Mir, gives a wooden delivery of his lines and behaves more like a Boy Scout or comic book superhero than a starship captain. While Ebert describes Shepard, played by Jennifer Hale, as quote, a take-no-prisoners feminist action hero in the tradition of Sigourney Weaver, unquote, and cites her taboo romance with a feminine alien from a monogendered species as a bold move for the mainstream sci-fi flick. The critics agree that supporting actor Raphael Sabarge, who Ebert identifies as having co-starred with Hale in, quote, one of the dozens of Star Wars prequels to hit the big screen in recent years, unquote, plays fundamentally the same character as in its previous role, but describe his sacrifice near the end of Act Two as one of the film's better moments. Siskel notes that the film is planned to be the first installment of a trilogy, and expresses hope that Mir will grow into the role. Siskel gives a thumbs down. Ebert gives a thumbs up. Experiment 1756-28 Date 2000 Content of Disc 12 hours of live ABC News coverage of the se attacks in the World Trade Center and Pentagon, beginning with the initial interruption of scheduled programming and ending with President George W. Bush's War on Terror nationwide address. Summary of Recording Both critics praised the verisimilitude of the film's special effects, describing it as one of the best bow documentaries since Orson Welles' War of the Worlds, 1938, and marveling at the number of on-air news personnel playing themselves, with Sisko finding the choice to cast Texas Governor George W. Bush as the president both interesting and unusual. Ebert praises Osama bin Laden, who he describes as the director of the film, for his quote, bold critique of America's national defenses and satirical outlook at foreign opinions of our country." Unquote. Though he questions his decisions to insert himself into the film as the prime suspect in organizing the attacks, both critics give a thumbs up. Experiment 1756-36 Date 2000 Content of Disc Frampton Comes Alive Disc 1 Music Album 1976 CD Deluxe Edition 2001 Summary of Recording Ebert describes the album as one of his favorites of all time, and states that he greatly enjoyed the opportunity to listen to it in digital THX audio, though he is disappointed by the fact that the presentation ends halfway through the album and hopes that the theatrical release of the second half is pending. Siskel, in contrast, is disappointed by the lack of any concert footage or other visual accompaniment to the music, and states that he could listen to music in the dark at home if he desired to, rather than spending money to do so at the theater. Siskel gives a thumbs down. Ebert gives a thumbs up. Experiment 1756-38 Date 2000 Content of Disc Classics of Literature A 1997 Windows CD-ROM Contain the text of 130 public domain novels. Summary of Recording Both critics praise the ability to hear some of the greatest novels of all time, narrated by their original authors, with Siskel describing author John Milton's narration of Paradise Lost as particularly moving, and Ebert finding Victor Hugo's recitation of Les Miserables excellent, but questioning his choice to read it in English, rather than his native French. Both critics question the running time of the film at approximately 1,600 hours. While Ebert calls it a great value for the admission price, he claims that he spent several thousand dollars on concessions during the screening, and apologizes to the audience for the 12-week hiatus that At The Movies took while he and Sisko were attending the screening. Both critics give a thumbs down, agreeing that, if broken into smaller installments, the film would be more enjoyable. Experiment 1756-41 Date 2000 Content of Disc A recording of Murder on the Orient Express, 1974, as affected by SCP-1989. 
Summary of Recording Ebert introduces the segment as part of a recurring series on the works of which he describes as quote, an artistic collective that's been taken the film world by storm. Unquote. Ebert praises the cinematic device of showing the altered film on a TV screen being filmed by another camera, and the digital manipulation of the original film footage to present the on-screen actors responding to the inversion of their world. Siskel praises the technical execution of the movie, but finds it unoriginal and derivative of the group's earlier work, and compares it unfavorably to previous films by the group, such as Man Being Eaten by No Shark, Sad Man, which he describes as being a seven-hour-long continuous shot of an atomic bomb sitting on a pedestal, and Cheese. Siskel gives a thumbs down, Ebert gives a thumbs up. Item number SCP-1989 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures Outside scheduled experimentation times, SCP-1989 is kept in Storage Containment Unit A-29 at Sector 19. Experimentation may only be performed with prior permission from a member of Level 3 personnel, and the tray must be emptied of all testing materials before returning to storage. Testing of materials altered by SCP-1989 with other SCP objects is to be approved on a case-by-case -case basis. Description: SCP-1989 is a Pioneer LD-V4200 single-sided laser disc player, capable of playing both CAV standard play and CLV extended play laser discs. SCP-1989 was acquired at the Clemson, South Carolina home of film critic Derwent Masterson III on November 5, 1992, as part of the liquidation of his assets following his suicide. Background intelligence and subsequent investigation revealed that the device was a birthday gift. See Addendum 1989-C. Initial inspection revealed internal congruence with other models of the same product line, with one exception. A non-standard disc tray different in shape but not material from the original design. When powered on, inserted with a film disc and connected to a compatible television, SCP-1989 appears to operate normally, playing the portion of the film recorded on the film disc correctly and without incident. However, due to each side of a laser disc only containing up to 60 minutes of possible recording space, most feature-length films require the playback of both sides, and sometimes multiple discs. SCP-1989 is a single-sided model player. Manual inversion and reinsertion of the disc is required during every complete viewing. When any disc previously inserted into SCP-1989 is removed, inverted, and reinserted, the content of the film is changed. When play resumes, the image on the screen is also inverted and gravity within the filmed environment adjusts accordingly. Within the first few seconds of playback, any unsecured objects, scenery, or characters appear to collide with the new bottom of the scene, whether it be the ceiling or open sky. Whether this effect and that observed in SCP-2251 are variations of the same phenomena is currently under investigation. At no point, however, is the narrative broken. Characters still present attempt to act out the recorded scenes and delivered lines, even though the environment around them has drastically changed. In the event of an outside scene where actors have fallen into the sky, camera angles continue to change as if following unseen events, until the scene changes. Characters and objects in subsequent scenes appear to have recovered from the initial inversion, though the events on screen continue to be hampered by the change in gravity and characters who sustain fatal injuries from the inversion or descend into the sky do not reappear for the remainder of playback. Addendum 1989-A Testing Logs Test Log 23 Testing Material Number 1989-TM0023 Testing Material Content Murder on the Orient Express 1974 Director Sidney Lumet 
Inversion Timestamp 47 minutes 25 seconds Transcript Exterior shot of Orient Express train stranded in snowdrift, with two train workers outside, facing camera. Image is inverted. At 47 minutes 27 seconds, the two train workers lift up from the ground and hurtle towards open sky. Large metallic screeching sound as train falls from track, followed by large quantities of snow and debris. Cut to interior train dining car. Train appears to be an upside-down freefall, accompanied by sounds of smashing glass, rushing winds, and rattling metal. Characters Hercule Poirot, Director Bianchi, and Conductor Pierre Michel on ceiling, clinging to wall railings. Character Dr. Constantine is unconscious, appearing to have suffered blunt force trauma from the light fitting directly above him at the time of flipping. Perrault is crawling forward on hands and knees in an effort to approach Pierre, clutching a notebook and a piece of paper. Perrault, shouting to be heard over the den. Excellent, Pierre. And could you summon to me the passengers to me here one by one in this order, with the exception of Princess Dregomirov, who is not only of royal blood, but is also much older than she says not to look? Pierre attempts to grab the piece of paper proffered by Perrault. Misses loses his grip on the railing and smashes through glass window of dining car, falling out of view. Perrault appears to not notice, and continues to address thin air. Perrault And Pierre, since you are here already, we can conveniently start by questioning you. Your full name is Pierre Paul Michel? No answer is heard, but Perrault continues as if there was. Perrault Two male saints' names. You must be greatly blessed. Redacted. Test Log 26 Testing Material Number 1989-TM0026 Testing Material Content Die Hard, 1988 Director John McTiernan Inversion Timestamp First Disc, 41 minutes, 55 seconds Transcript Interior Shot of Elevator Shaft John McClane is on top of an ascending elevator in heroic pose. Image and gravity inverted. McClane is now beneath the elevator, clinging to cable, still moving along previous trajectory. Top of elevator shaft fast approaching. Unable to maintain grip, McClane falls ten feet and is crushed by arriving elevator. Cut to thirty seconds of camera filming empty corridors lingering on a shot of a topless centerfold affixed to a utility box at approximately halfway. Redacted. Test Log 45 Testing Material Number 1989-TM0045 Testing Material Content Star Wars 1977 Director George Lucas Inversion Timestamp 57 minutes, 8 seconds Transcript Exterior shot of the Death Star in space, orbiting planet Alderaan. Image inverted. Cut to interior shot of Death Star Bridge. Princess Leia being led to Grand Moff Tarkin under armed guard, accompanied by Darth Vader. No change. Redacted. Test Log 57 Testing Material Number 1989-TM0057 Testing Material Content the Poseidon Adventure 1972 Director Robert Neem Inversion Timestamp 29 minutes 29 seconds Transcript Interior shot of SS Poseidon Ballroom Ship has capsized, with the majority of passengers on the ballroom ceiling. A few remain on the floor, clinging to the bolted-down tables and chairs, most of them appearing to be about to let go. Image and gravity inverted. Passengers about to die are suddenly the right way up again. Passengers on the ballroom ceiling, including most major characters, fall fifty feet to their deaths. Right way up passengers look at each other, bewildered, and appear to feign death, killing over one by one, in the order that they would have fallen. Cut to exterior of ship, angled underneath. SS Poseidon is the right way up, surrounded by an ocean of falling water. Redacted. Addendum 1989-B Acquisition Investigation Exhibit 1989-22-C1 
Excerpt from Derwent Masterson's film review column in the Greenville News. Printed October 29, 1992. Debate about whether film is an art form is nonsense. Films are meant to be enjoyed for their exciting content, the thrill of their car chases, and the beauty of their actresses. Narrative in film is inconsequential. You could turn the finest film topsy-turvy and you won't find one shred of art or entertainment beyond what the writers intend. No narrative imperative. The story is there to entertain. It isn't real. Addendum 1989C Acquisition Investigation Exhibit 1989-45C4 Note retreat amongst gift wrapping paper and wastebasket of Masterson home. Carter I hope this gives you a change of perspective. Enjoy, my friend. Happy Birthday, Derwent. Item Number SCP-3768 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures Information about the procedure of SCP-3768-A is to be contained in a single paper document at Site-59. Foundation Webcrawler 7-ORFEO is to excise and expunge any other information on the internet pertaining to SCP-3768-A. Standard information suppression campaigns are to be carried out at low priority for non-digital storage formats. A radio with the prepared SCP-3768-A arrangement is to be kept for research into SCP-3768-B. SCP-3768-B is to be monitored and recorded at Site-59 at the discretion of Director Nysmith. SCP-3768-A is a ritualistic procedure carried out through the use of 3.7 grams of zinc at least 400 grams of table salt, no more than 5 grams of silver, and 7 honeybee carcasses, at least 90% intact from death. These ingredients must be arranged in a specific formation around a civilian FM radio within 500 km of Baltimore, Maryland. Upon completion of SCP-3768-A, a new radio station can be accessed at 97.3 FM identified as Three Moons Public Radio, or 3MPR. The origin of this frequency is believed to be an extra-dimensional plane of reality. The show's 24-hour programming features news and editorials for the inhabitants of the signal's plane of origin. The host, who allegedly has never been off the air once in 300 years, identifies as a permanently 27-year-old female human of French Senegalese descent named Julie Niang hereafter identified as SCP-3768-C. Whether or not the recordings are factual is restricted to personnel with 5-3768 clearance. Selections from SCP-3768-B Recordings SCP-3768-C Good morning, Drissage. It is now 8 a.m. Old Eastern Standard Time. Meteorological station on left is maintaining a pleasant 62 degrees out today, so wear a light jacket if you're headed to the meat tree market. SCP-3768-C Lord Gonturus, also known as the Elephant King or the Ark Hedon, released an official public statement yesterday to celebrate the fact that he's temporarily sober for the first time in 300 years. He took questions from Saklovian reporters on the steps of the Marble Hall. In regard to the approximately 30,000 captives of his so-called meat orgies, Lord Gonturis responded with, quote, This was never a part of the plan. The Soma was tainted from the start. None of us can stop. I cannot stop. I am scared. Please help us. Male Voice I suppose it goes without saying that I've been bloody well disappointed the whole time. There I was, all, imagine there's no heaven and no hell below us. Then I'll wake up from the murder, and I'm in a place that manages to be both at the same time. Imagine there's no countries. Corbinic's got a few trillion countries, and they're in a permanent war with one another. SCP-3768-C Speaking of which, what are your thoughts on the Strider situation? Male Voice 
Interesting that you mention that. I've actually got a song about the whole affair lined up for the new album. It's called Dead Monkey, Good Monkey. Probably one of my least subtle tracks in a while. I haven't yelled so much in 40 years of life as I had in 30 minutes of recording. The boys and I were trying to go for an early Devin Townsend sound, you know? The angrier the better. Not to sidetrack too much, of course. So, as for the issue itself, as far as I'm concerned, the Striders gave piece a chance, then ate it, like they do with everything that isn't nailed to the ground in this hellhole. I'm not entirely convinced why we shouldn't just drop everything we have on Bogle Mountain. SCP-3768-C To no one's surprise, the Central Cabal's unanimous passing of the Mandatory Pan-Corbanese Human Sterilization Act or MPCHSA, has been causing controversy among the colonies, resulting in demonstrations across the lunar capital. Opponents, including the Child of Heaven Coalition, claim that the right to responsibly conceive children is inalienable. President Nyong, who is expected to sign the MPCHSA into law on Tuesday, released the following statement. Male Voice The world we live in now was meant to be the logical conclusion of our lives on Earth. To create new life here would be to create mortal life. When this happens, and it has happened all too often, the polarity of death is reversed and the departed mortal leaves to live forever in Corbinic's so-called sister universe. The tricky bit with this, of course, is that our world is designed for immortals, theirs isn't. There are two inevitable results, a guaranteed living nightmare drifting off in the deep space or in the custody of the Foundation, as with several extant case studies, or the presence of an unkillable human being on Earth with all the potential violence it would entail. SCP-3768-C In addition, Three Moons Press Secretary Lyndon B. Johnson has insisted that the sterilization measures are painless, non-invasive, and finally, some good news about this, will not affect libido. SCP-3768-C We have some breaking news to report out of Bogle Mountain. The Witch Queen, Hikati Bogle, may her name be thrice damned for eternity, has died of apparent liver failure. Though it has been previously believed that the Witch Queen was immortal, drone surveillance footage has confirmed the death of the Strider Matriarch, who was responsible for the consumption and agonizing digestion of over… immortal human colonists. Three Moon's intelligence officials in the Prefecture have reported the Witch Queen's last words to be Noleg Mezgen, which literally translates to, I find food planet. It is believed that the Witch Queen's post-mortem vector is identical to that of humans, with a possible spawn point in the Message from the Three Moons Initiative Foundation, we have some bad news. At an undetermined time in the coming months, the entity you know is SCP-PC-007, a hostile, reality-warping, 10-kilometer-tall and now immortal primate is going to enter the orbital path of Mars, en route to Earth. There is a negligible chance of neutralization if she is attacked before then, which becomes a full zero if she gets any nearer to Earth. Multiversal Iteration 2N If the records of Foundation terminology from Earth-2M are at all analogous to yours, you have an XK on your hands, at best. Look, she is aware of the existence of SCP-3319, and it'll likely be the first thing she'll smash to pieces. There's no easy exit here. This is going to be a long and difficult battle, and the best potential outcomes that the precogs and R&D can come up with involve the death of 87.5% of humanity. Many adjectives, doomed among them, come to mind. But the last thing you are in the coming months is alone. We've fought five wars against her and her armies, a good two of which were successful. You'll be provided with as much help as we can provide. And frankly, this is the angriest we've seen Lord Jalakara in a millennium. His grudge against her predates multicellular life. Even if our army is 75% paperwork and in fighting, we at least know he has an idea of what he's doing. And if she does cause your extinction, well, when you get to the Great Mead Hall of Saklavai, drinks are on us. You are watched. 
you are protected, and win or lose, you are loved. Three moons. Level 2 slash 5733 Classified Item Number SCP-5733 Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-5733 is currently contained in Tape Vault A, Shelf HS, Box Number 1984, and the Recorded Media Section of the Site-73 Archives. The Tape Vault is a controlled environment designed to mitigate data degradation arising from temperature and humidity. Efforts to identify the actors and locations depicted in SCP-5733 are still ongoing. Stills of the cast are compared weekly to new entrants in the Foundation Facial Recognition Database. A manual effort is underway to investigate contemporary film production sets and compare these to SCP-5733's locations. Testing of SCP-5733 is open to all Foundation employees, pending approval by lead researcher Dr. Carpenter. Details of the proposed testing approach must be submitted for approval in writing at a minimum of five working days prior to the desired testing date. Testing will take place in a Site-73 standard multi-purpose room, equipped with a video cassette recorder and television. Room location will be confirmed 48 hours prior to scheduled test. Following Incident 5733-01, all testing has been suspended. See Addendum 2 for further information. SCP-5733 is a VHS tape cassette containing a recording of the horror movie Return of the Suburb Slasher, which was, according to the cassette slipcase, produced by Crystal Elms Productions in 1983. No other record of this movie, production company, or cast has been found. The movie's plot follows protagonist Heather Campbell, preparing to host a party at her family residence, located in a suburban cul-de-sac, whilst her parents are away, portrayed by Alice Strode according to the film's opening credits. A road closed at one end, resulting in only a singular inlet or outlet. The date of the party coincides with the ten-year anniversary of a spree killing at the same cul-de-sac. Heather only becomes aware of this later on in the film. The killings were committed by an unknown assailant, dubbed the Suburb Slasher by locals and media in the aftermath. During the party, the Suburb Slasher, henceforth SCP-5733-1, returns to the cul-de-sac and, in a manner consistent with contemporary horror movie tropes, proceeds to stalk and murder all five of the friends Heather has invited over, and a police officer who visits the cul-de-sac on a routine drive-by. SCP-5733-1's identity remains a mystery throughout the film. They wear a black burlap sack over their face, and black, loose-fitted overalls, and do not speak at any point of the movie's duration. SCP-5733's Anomalous Properties Manifest at the 97th minute of the cassette's runtime. At the 95th minute, Heather discovers her friend's corpses staged in her living room. SCP-5733-1 appears at the other side of the room and begins to chase Heather. Heather runs into the house basement and locks the door behind her. Once secure in the basement, Heather turns to the camera and says a variation of the following speech. Hey, mister. I don't know you. And I don't know why you just sat there watching this without doing nothing, but please, I'm begging you, help me out here. What can I do to survive this? Variations include addressing the viewer as Miss, Ma'am, All of You, in lieu of Mr., and in lieu of sat there, stood there, or lying there. Following this, the viewer of SCP-5733 can directly converse with Heather henceforth designated SCP-5733-2, and advise her on how to escape from SCP-5733-1. The course of the movie then depends on the conversations held with SCP-5733-2. SCP-5733-2 
will only converse with the viewer on the aforementioned topic. If the viewer ignores SCP-5733-2, or attempts to talk to her concerning topics other than SCP-5733-1, she, in a resigned manner, will walk back up the basement stairs, unlock, and open the door, including SCP-5733 and her anomalous nature. SCP-5733-1 will be waiting directly outside the door. The film will then cut to black, and SCP-5733 ejects itself from the machine on which it is being played. When the tape of SCP-5733 is examined, it has a runtime of 97 minutes, ending with SCP-5733-2 locking herself in the basement, but before she speaks to the viewer. Viewers of SCP-5733 often develop self-destructive and obsessive behavioral tendencies. This effect is not believed to be anomalous. Despite extensive testing, SCP-5733-2 has yet to escape from SCP-5733-1. SCP-5733-1 often seems to display advanced knowledge of the viewer's recommendations and advised course of action and uses this to preemptively sabotage escape attempts. Addendum 5733.1 Testing Log All below testing was overseen and arranged by lead researcher Dario A. Carpenter. Test 001 Subject D-1973 Advice D-1973 Ask SCP-5733-2 if she has a car. She responds in the affirmative. D-1973 follows this by telling SCP-5733-2 to sneak back upstairs, find the keys to the car, exit by the back door, and drive, quote, as far away from here as possible, unquote. Outcome SCP-5733-2 successfully manages to obtain the car keys and leave the residence without encountering SCP-5733-1. However, when she reaches her car, she finds the tires have been slashed and begins to panic. D-1973 urges SCP-5733-2 to smash the window of her neighbor's car and unlock the door. After some convincing, SCP-5733-2 does so, and D-1973 proceeds to talk her through the process of hotwiring a car. The car successfully started. SCP-5733-2 laughs and begins to drive away. As she pulls out of the cul-de-sac, SCP-5733-1 leans up from where it is hit on the back seat of the car. SCP-5733-1 brandishes a kitchen knife. SCP-5733-2 screams. The tape cuts to black. Test 002 Subject D-1944 Advice D-1944 tells SCP-5733-2 to retrieve her father's shotgun, which is shown at the 25-minute mark of SCP-5733, and use this to eliminate SCP-5733-1. Outcome SCP-5733-2 sneaks up to her parents' bedroom and retrieves the gun. At that point, the camera reveals SCP-5733-1 stood in the bedroom doorway. SCP-5733-2 aims the gun and pulls the trigger, yet nothing happens as the gun is not loaded. SCP-5733-1 holds up his right hand and opens his palm. The shotgun's shells fall out. SCP-5733-1 brandishes a kitchen knife and approaches SCP-5733-2. SCP-5733-2 screams. The tape cuts to black. Test 003 Subject D-1958 Advice D-1958 tells SCP-5733-2 that resistance against SCP-5733-1 is useless, and that she should use a pair of garden shears in the basement to commit suicide. Outcome SCP-5733-2 responds that this is not an option and begins to sob. After ten minutes, SCP-5733-2 stands up from the floor, 
walks up the basement stairs, and opens the door. SCP-5733-1 has stood outside waiting. The tape cuts to black. Test 011 Subject, Assistant Researcher Felissa Baker After no negative effects were observed in D-Class subjects, aside from non-anomalous psychological trauma, testing was opened up the General Foundation staff from this test. Advice. After a conversation with SCP-5733-2 on her state of mind and skills, Dr. Baker believed her best course of action will be to obtain assistance from others. Dr. Baker recommended SCP-5733-2 go from house to house in the cul-de-sac in an attempt to find neighbors who could aid her. Outcome: SCP-5733-2 left the basement and house without incident, and went to the residence of Mr. Loomis, her next-door neighbor. Upon arrival, she found the door ajar and lights off. Creeping through the house, SCP-5733-2 discovers Mr. Loomis and a figure she believes to be his wife apparently sleeping in bed. On attempting to wake him, SCP-5733-2 discovers that he is dead, with his throat slit. The figure in bed next to him gets up, and upon pulling back the covers, is revealed to be SCP-5733-1. SCP-5733-2 screams. The tape cuts to black. Test 015 Subject, Assistant Researcher Nick England Daskowitz Advice, Dr. England Daskowitz explains to SCP-5733-2 that he works for an organization which may be able to help her, and that she should try to call for help from the house phone. He gives SCP-5733-2 a cover foundation phone number in operation in the year 1983. Outcome: SCP-5733-2 emerges from the basement and makes her way to the kitchen, where the landline telephone is located. Upon reaching it, SCP-5733-2 finds that the phone has been destroyed, and a note, written in what appears to be blood, has been impaled into the wreckage with a kitchen knife. SCP-5733-2 reads the note aloud and shows it to the camera, asking Dr. England Daskovitz what it means. It reads, The only foundation here is fear. Before he can answer, he alerts SCP-5733-2 to the presence of SCP-5733-1, who has appeared behind her. SCP-5733-1 brandishes another kitchen knife. SCP-5733-2 screams. The tape cuts to black. Test 017 Subject, Field Agents Malcolm Pleasance and Donald McDowell Advice: The field agents were elected for the test due to their knowledge of hand-to-hand -hand combat techniques. They advise SCP-5733-2 to search the basement for supplies, to see how long she can remain there. Once it has been established, that a small amount of food and water are available. The agents begin to teach SCP-5733-2 fighting techniques. Outcome: SCP-5733-2 is able to remain in the basement for a period of 112 hours before running out of supplies. It should be noted that, according to in-universe clocks, this resulted in SCP-5733-2 leaving the basement at 10 a.m. Despite this, Light levels upon leaving the basement are more consistent with the time between 11 p.m. and 1 a.m. During this time, Pleasance and McDowell have delivered content equivalent to a basic introductory combat course. The agents have delivered this training in shifts, and when SCP-5733-2 has slept, one agent has stayed awake to keep watch for SCP-5733-1. SCP-5733-2 emerges from the basement and makes her way to the house's front door, where she is confronted by SCP-5733-1. The two engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat over a period of 23 minutes, as they fight throughout the house. SCP-5733-2 is able to deploy the techniques taught to her by both agents, and, at the conclusion of the fight, knocks SCP-5733-1 to the floor. SCP-57 
SCP-5733-2 picks up a candlestick from the dining room table and prepares to attack SCP-5733-1. Both her and the agent celebrate. As she raises the candlestick above her head, the camera pans to reveal a second SCP-5733-1 instance creeping up from behind her. The instance leaps at her, and the tape cuts to black momentarily before contact is made. During Test 017, both SCP-5733-1 instances display levels of physical prowess and knowledge of combat techniques not demonstrated in other tests. Test 028 Subject Field Agent Tilda Joan Bennett Advice Agent Bennett was chosen for testing due to her advanced knowledge of thaumaturgy. Agent Bennett instructs SCP-5733-2 on how to use rudimentary thaumaturgy for offensive and defensive purposes. After several hours, SCP-5733-2 is able to sign basic protective glyphs and perform low-level phonological elemental spells. Outcome: SCP-5733-2 makes it to the front line before encountering SCP-5733-1, who brandishes a kitchen knife and walks towards her. On Agent Bennett's advice, SCP-5733-2 signs a protective glyph. SCP-5733-1 attacks SCP-5733-2, but the knife bounces off her and away from SCP-5733-1 due to the thaumaturgical protection. SCP-5733-2 counters with a wind spell, which pushes SCP-5733-1 away from her. SCP-5733-2 takes advantage of this opportunity and begins to run down her driveway. SCP-5733-1 gives chase and displays previously unseen thaumaturgical skills by casting a freeze spell on SCP-5733-2, locking her in place. SCP-5733-1 casts a summoning spell, drawing the kitchen knife back into his hand. SCP-5733-2 tries to scream but cannot. The tape cuts to black. Addendum 5733.2 Incident 5733-01 Forward. Following a review of all previous testing, SCP-5733 lead researcher, Dr. Carpenter, devised the following test, with himself as the subject. In preparation of the test, Dr. Carpenter had his team prepare possible options through which SCP-5733-2 may be able to escape from SCP-5733-1. Options were divided into the following categories. What to take from the basement. Where to go upon emerging from the basement. How to exit the house. How to exit the cul-de-sac. Each of the above categories was to contain at least 20 options and, under no circumstances, was Dr. Carpenter to be consulted on, or informed of, what these options would be. On the day of the test, these options were printed out and placed into plastic bowls correlating to the above categories. In addition to this, three cards reading face, body, and legs were created. On the day of the test, Dr. Carpenter began watching SCP-5733. At the 95th minute, two minutes before anomalous property manifest, research assistants placed the four bowls in front of him and the three cards. Face down. The final test. Subject: Dario Carpenter. Advice: Dr. Carpenter informed SCP-5733-2 that he would be selecting instructions for her at random, and that it was imperative she followed them to the letter. Advice: What to take from the basement. With eyes diverted, Dr. Carpenter placed his hand to the first bowl and selected an option. He informed SCP-5733-2 to arm herself with the pair of garden shears present in the basement and began climbing the stairs to the exit. Outcome: With no objections, SCP-5733-2 armed herself and began to climb. Advice: Where to go upon emerging from the basement? Dr. Carpenter selected an option from the second bowl and informed SCP-5733-2 that she was to go to her upstairs bedroom then come back down to the dining room. Outcome: 
SCP-5733-2 followed the instructions given. There is no sight of SCP-5733-1 at this point of the test. Advice: How to exit the house Dr. Carpenter selected an option from the third bowl. He told SCP-5733-2 to sprint back upstairs and into her parents' bedroom, where she was to climb out the window, onto the roof, and then drop down to the garden. Outcome. SCP-5733-2 followed the instructions given. There is still no sight of SCP-5733-1 at this point of the test. Advice: How to exit the cul-de-sac Dr. Carpenter selected an option from the fourth bowl. He informs SCP-5733-2 that she is to jump over the fence into her neighbor's garden, make her way to the front of the property, and run down the street until she finds help. Outcome: SCP-5733-2 follows the instructions given, and makes it to the road out of the cul-de-sac, which she proceeds to run down. The camera pans, and SCP-5733-1 can be seen bursting out the door of SCP-5733-2's residence. SCP-5733-2 continues to flee, and SCP-5733-1 does not give chase. SCP-5733-2 begins to celebrate, and is asked by Dr. Carpenter how far away the nearest police station is. SCP-5733-2 responds that she does not know, but that together, they'll find it. The road out of the cul-de-sac is uninhabited. The roads are lined by trees and the occasional streetlight. SCP-5733-2 continues running for a period of 20 minutes before she slows down to catch her breath. By this point, the trees have begun to grow scarce, yet only darkness can be seen beyond them. SCP-5733-2 walks for another five minutes. The trees once lying the road have disappeared. Either side of the road is flanked by a pitch-black darkness. Dr. Carpenter asks SCP-5733-2 if she can see anything on the roadside. She responds in the negative. Dr. Carpenter goes on to instruct SCP-5733-2 to take off a bracelet she is wearing, and throw it off the road. As soon as the bracelet passes over the boundary between the road and darkness, it vanishes and cannot be seen. SCP-5733-2 asks Dr. Carpenter what she should do next. Dr. Carpenter responds that she should keep walking. An hour passes, with the road remaining straight. There have been no other signs of life. Trees once again begin to populate the boundary of the road, growing in density the more time goes by. SCP-5733-2 comments that she can see lights and houses up ahead and begins to speed up. As she approaches the houses, SCP-5733-2 begins to run and shout for help. When she arrives, she recognizes the location. She has arrived back at the cul-de-sac where she lives. Panicked, SCP-5733-2 asks Dr. Carpenter what is happening. Before he has a chance to respond, SCP-5733-1 begins to approach SCP-5733-2 brandishing a kitchen knife. Dr. Carpenter moves to the three cards set face down, and picks one at random. Face. He yells at SCP-5733-2 to use the shears to attack SCP-5733-1 in the facial region. She dodges his first swing of the knife, and successfully counterattacks. The burlap sack covering SCP-5733-1's face rips. Dr. Carpenter turns over a second card and shouts instructions to attack SCP-5733-1's legs. SCP-5733-2 does so successfully, crippling SCP-5733-1's movement. Dr. Carpenter goes to reach for the last card. As his fingers touch it, he realizes he already knows what it says as the last remaining card, body. He yells at SCP-5733-2 to attack SCP-5733-1's torso and to attempt to land a critical blow to the heart or other vital organs. SCP-5733-2 does so, but SCP-5733-1 dodges the attack, grabs the shears from her, and pushes her to the ground. The camera tilts up. 
from SCP-5733-2 on the ground to SCP-5733-1 space, only partially covered by the now damaged burlap sack. Dr. Carpenter approaches the television screen, staring at SCP-5733-1. With the sack damaged, SCP-5733-1's face can be seen, staring straight at the camera. SCP-5733-1 is a visually identical match to Dr. Carpenter. SCP-5733-2 screams. The tape cuts to black. All testing has been suspended, whilst investigations are underway into whether use of SCP-5733 by Foundation staff constitutes a data leak. A review of past test subjects' current and historic assignments is underway. Update. Another tape has been found. Level 2-6733 Classified Item Number SCP-6733 Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-6733 is currently contained in Tape Vault F, Shelf ST, Box Number 1994, in the Recorded Media section of the Site-73 Archives. The Tape Vault is a controlled environment designed to mitigate data degradation arising from temperature and humidity. Efforts to identify the actors and locations depicted in SCP-6733 are currently ongoing. Stills of the cast are compared weekly to new entrants in the Foundation Facial Recognition Database. A manual effort is underway to investigate contemporary film production sets and compare these to SCP-6733's locations. Description: SCP-6733 is a VHS tape cassette containing a recording of the horror movie The Suburb Slasher Strikes Again, which was, according to the cassette slipcase, produced by Crystal Elms Productions in 1985. The movie appears to be a sequel to SCP-5733, The Suburb Slasher Returns. The primary antagonist of SCP-6733 is The Suburb Slasher. 6733-1, a spree killer who was also present in SCP-5733. When watched, the film causes the observer to become a conduit for the localized destabilization of reality. Only one viewing of the film, ordered by research lead Dr. Carpenter, has been conducted and documented. See test details below. However, it is currently hypothesized that testing may have occurred more times than currently thought. Investigation is underway. Testing The testing order comprised of D-Class personnel being shown SCP-5733 up to the point its anomalous properties manifest. The same D-Class was then to be shown SCP-6733, with the tape inserted into a VHS player attached to a television situated in a testing chamber. Given the unknown effects of SCP-6733, the D-Class would be left alone in the chamber to watch the film, and interviewed following the conclusion of the film. The contents of SCP-6733 and its effects are documented in the addenda below. Addendum 6733.1 Testing Log Act 1 Testing Log Footage begins. Dr. Malcolm Baines enters the testing chamber. D-1974 is sat down, opposite a television and VHS set. Hi, Jamie. I'm assisting in today's experiments. How are you feeling following the film? Hey, good to meet you. I'm feeling okay, thanks. One of the nicer experiments I've been involved in. Good to hear. We're just going to run some quick tests. Over the next five minutes, Dr. Baines administers cognitive impairment tests to D-1974. All results are within baseline. Okay, so, with those out of the way, let's talk about the film. Could you tell me what you saw, please? Like, the plot and stuff? Yes, that sounds like a good starting point. It was pretty much your standard slasher film. There was a group of teens who just graduated high school and go to a local camping site by a lake to celebrate. 
One of them mentions it's near the site where the killer, the Slasher, was shot dead by police a year prior after a rampage. Would this be the events of the first film? D-1974 shrugs. It's not really clear. They all think it's a joke, apart from the main girl. She says her dad's a police officer, and she's seen video evidence of the attack. No one references any of the characters from the first film, though, and they don't show up in this one either. The slasher's the only constant. Interesting. Please continue. So they all go camping by the lake, but soon everything starts going to shit. The site's caretaker gets killed off-screen. Then the slasher starts stalking the kids and doing away with them. Doing away how? Uh, let's see. D-1974 checks the notes he made during the screening. He's still got a kitchen knife, same weapon as the first film, so he stabs a lot of them. It's pretty gory for the time it was made. He slashes up someone's face, then the nerdy guy gets stabbed through the eye. That one's pretty good. The camera gets sprayed with blood. One of the last teens gets his head crushed wide open. D-1974 chuckles to himself. There's a walk-in freezer in the main admin building, where one of her mates has been hung up. It's never explained why a campsite needs one of those, but it's just there. <laughs> the slasher locks someone in there, then throws her body, shattering it into a bloody, icy slush. How do these scenes make you feel? Like, there's some good jump scares, and the tension's fairly high at points, but it's a little dated. I've seen scarier, but I've also seen worse horrors. Anything feel like it particularly lingers and stays with you? D-1974 does not immediately respond. Well, the end scene. The end scene is pretty weird. Tell me about it. D-1974 fidgets, avoiding eye contact with Dr. Baines. So. The girl and her best friend, the one that's been looking out for her this whole time, enter into a cellar. The slasher creeps up from behind and grabs the friend, tears his head clean off his neck. The slasher then chases the final teen to the side of the lake. He's advancing on her. The camera's set on the water of the lake. It's a wide shot. You've got the lake waterline parallel to the top and bottom of the shot, so it splits the screen horizontally. She's fallen over, crawling away from him. As he advances on her, the camera zooms in. Slowly, though. It takes its time. He does, too. There's music at the start of the scene. Deep, dark synths. This stops as the camera moves closer, though. I forgot to say, it's… it's a long scene. Longer than five minutes. Maybe it was ten. I don't know. It felt longer than ten. So the slasher's approaching her. We're, the viewers, approaching the shore. Then the music stops, and it's just his footsteps and her pleading. And she's pleading, man. She's… There's these big inhales of breath stifled by the mucus running out of her nose. She's babbling, but it gets to a point she's not even saying words, just making noise. D-1974 appears visibly distressed. What next? The camera's real close to the shore now, and the slasher stops. He turns his head and looks straight at the camera. You can't see his eyes, but you know he's looking straight at you. And he just stands there, staring. Eventually the girl crawls out of the frame, or the camera zooms past her. I can't remember which. It just keeps zooming in on his face, where his face should be under the hood. The girl keeps screaming off camera. Then there's this guttural ripping noise and the screaming stops. It just stops, but the camera keeps moving. You can see the individual droplets of blood splashed across him. You can see the fabrics that make up his hood. His face soon takes up the entire shot, and then… and then… it ends. No credits or nothing. The tape just cuts to black, and was pushed out the player. That's it? There was nothing else? No, that was it. Why would I lie? I didn't say you lied. When the girl was pleading, was she pleading at you? What do you mean? Was it like she was talking specifically to you? To Jamie? No, I don't think so. It was just… it was a disturbing scene. There wasn't anything weird in an anomalous sense. I just haven't seen a film end like that before. Okay, I understand. Was there anything else notable about the film? 
Anything else out the ordinary? D-1974 takes a moment to contemplate the question. I can't remember their name. Whose name? The girl. Her friends. All of them. I don't think they had names. Addendum 6733.2 Incident Log Act 2 Incident Log Dr. Baines enters D-1974's dormitory room. Hey, Doc. D-1974 rubs his eyes as Dr. Baines enters. Jamie, you wanted to speak with me? Yeah, I had questions. I wanted to know why I had to watch that film the other day. You know I can't share details like that with you. Why do you ask? I just… it wasn't snuff, right? It wasn't real? Everything's real in a sense. We have a tape of it. It must have been filmed. But as to the nature of the deaths, it's difficult to say. Did the effects seem realistic? You described one as corny yesterday. I thought it was yesterday, but now I'm not so sure. I kept thinking about the film as I went to sleep, and then I dreamt it. I was there, crawling by the lake, and I remembered all my friends and their deaths, and they seemed so real. And when I woke up, I could have sworn, I could have sworn that there was a shadow outside my room, someone leering in through the frosted glass of the door. What did you do? I was frozen. I've never felt fear like it before. I just sat upright in my bed, staring at the door. I hoped that if I kept watching, it wouldn't come in. When the sun rose and the light entered my room, it faded away. What's the scariest thing you've seen here? I… I don't understand the question. You must have worked with Anami before, or is this your first? Dr. Baines is silent for a moment. Why don't we get back to talking about you? You know there couldn't have been anyone outside yesterday. Security guard in the corridor would have seen something and raised the alarm. I want you to keep me updated, though. Any other dreams? See anything else that's untoward? Let me know. Thank you, Dr. Baines. Please, call me Malcolm. Dr. Baines leaves the dormitory, entering the adjacent corridor. He walks to the end and talks to the guard on duty. Hey, hopefully a quick one. Do you know the name of the person stationed here last night? Agent Cunningham. Or it was meant to be. He was assigned but failed to show, went to town before his shift and didn't come back. Bosses will have him fired faster than anything when he does show. I see. Thank you for your time. Night Falls Surveillance footage of the site exterior flags a humanoid shape moving through the surrounding forest. A guard appears and investigates, but finds nothing. Interior D-1974's dormitory. He tosses and turns in his sleep, before suddenly awaking and beginning to scream. A guard rushes into the room and calms him, then asks what is wrong. D-1974 is unable to recall what they dreamt. An intruder alert is generated on the sewage pipe in Sector STNKG. Security guards are dispatched. They make their way through the site to the sector and begin a search. After completing the search with no results, the alarm is deemed a false alarm. D-1974 is situated in an interview room, sat at a table in front of a one-way mirror. Dr. Bain swipes his keycard and enters the room. D-1974 stands and rushes over to him. Oh, Malcolm, thank God. You need to help me, please. Slow down, slow down. Let's sit down, okay? What's going on? The two walk back over to the table and take a seat. I'm in danger. It's coming for me. I just know it is. I feel like I'm being watched. I hear the pair of eyes constantly burrowing into the back of my skull. And I saw it. I saw it! Jamie, calm down. What did you see? The slasher. The suburb slasher. Out of the corner of my eye. Around corners. It's stalking me. I'm going to end up just like the victims in the film. You've got to help me. Look, it's okay. It's okay. Take a deep breath for a second. There is a moment of silence as D-1974 collects himself. The slasher can't be here. It would have tripped our security systems, shown up on surveillance. This isn't a sparsely populated site. 
Other people would have seen it. That's just a thing. It only appears when I'm alone, in between shifts, walking to my next assignment. It just stares at me, from a distance. It'll be in a place I can't reach, like on a walkway above me, or on the other side of a security door. The one time I said something, I tried to shout. It came out more like a whimper. It just walked away, but it didn't break eye contact. I'm going to need to notify security about this immediately, and I think it would be good if we got you some medicine, something that would calm you down. You don't believe me? I'm not saying that. I just think you've not slept, and you're in a heightened state right now. If we're going to figure out what's going on, we need you lucid. How long have you worked at the Foundation? Excuse me? You know what you're doing, right? Of course I do. So I'm going to go get and get… Dr. Baines pauses. Fuck. Let me try that again. I'm going to go and get help. Is that okay? After a brief moment, D-1974 nods. Stay here. I'll be back shortly. Dr. Baines walks through the room door, swipes his keycard to unlock it, and leaves. It's going to be okay. You're going to be okay. It's going to be okay. D-1974 continues to repeat this mantra to himself. He stands, and begins to pace the room. D-1974 halts in place. He turns to face the mirror and exhales. His breast condenses in front of him. Temperature sensors within the room register a significant drop. You're here, aren't you? A gloved fist punches through the mirror. D-1974 screams. The shattered glass sprays across the room. D-1974 runs to the door. He hurriedly punches a combination to the door keypad, which glows red in a negative response. He shouts in frustration. The fist is withdrawn, then punches through the mirror once more, sending the remaining glass shattered into the floor. In the observation room on the other side stands an entity resembling the suburb slasher, SCP-6733-1. No. No, 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 no. D-1974, hurried, tries another numerical combination. The keypad flashes red once more. 6733-1 climbs through the broken mirror. Broken glass crackles as it steps into the interview room. Come on! Please! D-1974 tries once again to open the door. 6733-1 begins to walk slowly towards him. In its right hand, it carries a large kitchen knife. It reaches out with its left towards D-1974, who enters the last number in his latest combination attempt. The keypad flashes green, and the door swings open. 6733-1 lurches forward, but D-1974 throws himself into the adjoining hallway, narrowly avoiding its grasp. They hit the corridor wall and collapse to the floor. Help! Somebody help me! D-1974 attempts to stand and run towards the corridor's southern end, but missteps and falls once more. 6733-1 enters the corridor. It brandishes a kitchen knife and approaches D-1974. Hey, what's going on? At that moment, Security Officer Lauren has turned into the corridor from the north, whilst on patrol. He draws his weapon and aims at 6733-1. Put the knife down and step away from him. 6733-1 turns and faces the officer. It does not put down the knife. Last chance. I'm not playing around here. 6733-1 begins to stride up the corridor towards Lauren. I warned you! The security officer fires a single shot at 6733-1. The entity appears unaffected and continues to march forward. What the… Lauren fires a second shot, then a third, a fourth, a fifth. 6733-1 is unimpeded. S stop Lauren continues to fire. 6733-1 is soon stood right in front of him. Lauren fires again, point blank, yet the bullet seemingly had no effect. It continues to pull the trigger, generating a clicking noise from the empty chamber. 6733-1 stands momentarily still, 
before grabbing Lauren by the neck and raising him upwards, effortlessly. 6733-1 branches the kitchen knife. Officer Lauren screams. 6733-1 thrusts the kitchen knife upwards, through Lauren's submental space. The knife travels via his mouth and into his nasal cavity. 6733-1 then forcefully pulls the knife towards itself, partially bisecting the front of Lauren's face. D-1974 watches, horrified. As 6733-1 turns round to face him, a security siren begins to sound, elsewhere. Site security are in the process of being mobilized to contain the anomaly. D-1974 turns and flees. The following events are captured by the security cameras in the southern staff locker room. D-1974 runs into the room, looking around hurriedly. Researcher Wesley McCray is the only person in the room, having just finished a shift. Hey, what are you doing unaccompanied? D-1974 puts his fingers to his lips and shushes Researcher McCray. Hide. We need to hide. Now hold on. There's no time to explain. It's coming. D-1974 runs to a row of lockers, opens one, and climbs in. His panicked face is just visible through the locker slits. After a moment of contemplation, McCray follows him, climbing into a locker directly opposite. A few moments later, SCP-6733-1 enters the room. It stalks once around the room, before standing at the end of a row of lockers, the row where D-1974 is hidden. It throws open the first locker. The door slams against the next locker, before bouncing back. The sound of metal on metal reverberates through the room. 6733-1 makes its way down the lockers, throwing each door open. It reaches the locker D-1974 is hidden in. It stands, silently in front of it for a moment, before whirling round and opening the opposite locker, containing McCray. What? No! 6733-1 brandishes the kitchen knife. Researcher McCray screams. The knife plunges into McCray's right orbit. Vitreous fluid bursts out as the eyeball loses its structural integrity. His right glass's lens shatters, and broken glass falls into the orbital cavity. 6733-1 applies pressure, driving the knife further. Blood jettisons from McCray's eye, splattering across the ceiling. Footage is temporarily obfuscated by blood. Attempting to withdraw the knife from McCray's corpse, 6733-1 discovers it is stuck. D-1974 throws open the locker door, hitting 6733-1 and knocking it off balance long enough for him to escape, exiting the room. 6733-1 affixes McCray's head to the floor with his right foot and pulls on the knife with both hands. It rockets upwards, and 6733-1 resumes its chase of D-1974. No security footage covers the path taken by the pair upon leaving the room. After a few minutes, the Security Reconnaissance Team REC, comprised of four members, arrives in the locker room. The team lead, Owens, kneels down and examines McCray's body. We need to find this thing, and fast, let's split up. The team walk towards the room exit. The sight lights are dimmed. The rec team turn on their weapon flashlights. Madal, Melor. Take the corridor west, sweep every room. Rosso, with me, will head east. D-1974 runs through the site in search of aid. He makes his way throughout a maze of corridors, banging on doors and calling out for help. He finds none. Owens and Rosso enter the Department of Cryogenics Laboratories. Despite being devoid of researchers, equipment is still running. Owens turns to Rosso. I'll be right back. Owen heads deeper into one of the laboratories, as Rosso heads in the other direction. Clouds of condensed liquid roll out of open cryogenic fluid containers and tumble across the laboratory floor. Owen scans the room and notices the door to a storage locker is ajar. He takes the safety off his weapon and slowly approaches. He throws the door open. The locker is empty. Owens turns around to continue his search, only to be confronted by 6733-1 stood directly behind him. Owens opens fire, 
directly into 6733-1's torso, but it has no effect. 6733-1 grabs the agent with both hands and throws him across the room. With a splash, Owens lands directly in a container of cryogenic fluid. Hey Owens, you in here? A short time later, Rosa returns looking for Owens. Owens! Owens, can you hear me? The container Owens was thrown into shows no sign of him. Suddenly, Rosa is knocked forward into the floor by an unknown force from behind. A shattering sound is heard. Ugh. He hits the floor with force. Many small red crystalline objects are scattered around him. Oh God! From the vantage point of the newly online camera, it is evident that the crystalline objects are the remnants of Owen's frozen corpse. Impaled in Rosa's back is a large fragment of frozen ribcage. SCP-6733-1 emerges from the shadows in the corner of the room. He slowly walks up to Rosso, who attempts to crawl away. Rosso looks up at 6733-1, which has positioned itself in front of him. P please 6733-1 responds to Rosso's request by raising its right foot and pressing down on his head. Rosso's face meets the floor as 6733-1 continues to apply pressure. Rosso attempts to scream as a puddle of blood begins to pull beneath his face. His arms swing wildly. With a sudden crack, his scalp splits open and spurts out a mess of viscera. Rosso goes limp. 6733-1 continues to step down. A stream of blood spurts from Rosso's scalp. Then, abruptly, his skull is crushed, and 6733-1's foot goes straight through fragments of bone, skin, hair, and brain, stamping on the floor beneath. Dr. Baines makes his way back to the interview room. Turning into the corridor, he spots the corpse of Officer Lauren. Oh no. Hello? Are you? Dr. Baines begins to run to Lauren's corpse. He stops calling out to it as he notices his mangled face. Hello? Is anyone there? Jamie? Dr. Baines continues to make his way through the site. He comes to the entrance of the site basement. He glances down the stairs before turning to leave. A noise is heard behind him, and he freezes. Jamie, is that you? He turns and begins to make his way slowly down the basement stairs. The steps creak upon contact. He reaches the bottom and enters the dimly lit basement. A figure jumps out from the shadows. Shh! We've got to be quiet. It's close. Jamie! You're alright. I was just in the interview room and I thought you were dead. I tried to find you, but I couldn't. The site's abandoned. I can't find anyone. You… you were just in the interview room, where you left me earlier? Yes, I went to find help. But there's no one else here. It's just us two. We need to stick together. That part of the site is over an hour away on foot. Dr. Bain stares at D-1974. We're scared and tired. It doesn't matter. We just need to press on. Despite everything we know, I think you can't comprehend unadulterated pure evil until it stares right at you. Today, I think evil has us in its sights. As Dr. Baines begins to move further into the basement, D-1974 takes a step up the stairs. Jamie, we go this way, but we need to stay close. This way. This way? Into the dark, creepy basement? Are you serious? D-1974 turns and continues up the stairs. Jamie. Wait! D-1974 reaches the top of the stairs. Don't leave! D-1974 emerges from the basement. Full power has returned to the sight lights, to the extent D-1974 and his surroundings look overexposed. He holds up his arm, shielding his eyes from the light. He proceeds to stumble through the corridor, trying to handle to each door as he goes. The last breaks off in his hand. He drops it and continues on, eventually returning to outside the interview room. Baines was right. I… I swore it was the other side of the site. A pool of congealing blood covers the corridor floor. Within it lies Officer Lauren's handgun. The corpse, however, is nowhere to be seen. D-1974 picks up the gun and proceeds onwards. He turns into the next corridor, 
and immediately shouts out. Oh, thank God. Hello? Hello? Ahead, a figure rests against the corridor wall. D-1974 runs towards it. I need help. There's been a breach. We need to get out of- As he approaches, D-1974 trails off. The figure in front of him is dressed in sight security gear. It holds a lit cigarette in his left hand. It raises the cigarette and inserts the end into its exposed trachea. The trachea slurps and contracts as the cigarette smoke is inhaled. Out, out, out of here. R.E.C. Rosso raises his spare hand and swats in the direction of D-1974. As he does so, the mess of fibers and viscera at the top of his neck, exposed by the absence of a head, flap about. D-1974 steps backwards, bumping into an unknown object. He spins around and begins to stutter, but is interrupted. We're on break. Fuck off. R.E.C. Vidal and R.E.C. Miller walk around D-1974 towards R.E.C. Rosso. The latter reaches into his pocket and pulls out a carton of cigarettes, offering them to his newly arrived teammates. This better not be another rewrite. D-1974 sprints away. The camera follows, positioned closely behind him. He navigates through a complex maze of corridors, which seem to grow increasingly narrow. He enters corridor after corridor, until he turns into one and freezes. Ahead of him stands 6733-1. He pulls out the gun, aims and fires. Nothing happens. He pulls the gun near his face to take a closer look, before switching from holding the handle to the barrel. He squeezes. The gun shatters. Fragile plastic fragments scatter across the floor. I found you. D-1974 startles, as Dr. Baines approaches him from behind. It's okay, you're improvising. We can work with that. But we need to get to the basement, Jamie. You understand that, right? Dr. Baines reaches out towards D-1974. Get away from me! With its full force, D-1974 shoves Dr. Baines away, sending him flying backwards. He collides with the corridor wall. The entirety of the wall shakes before falling completely backwards. As it hits the floor, wooden splinters erupt into the air. Dr. Baines falls with it. Next, a lighting rig falls from the ceiling. It lands on Dr. Baines, pinning him in place. The fallen wall exposes only pitch black darkness behind it. Ah! What the fuck do you think you're doing? Oh Christ! Oh shit! An unidentified woman runs into the frame. I'm. I'm sorry. Are you hurt? I'm alright, I'm alright. Fucking amateurs, man. Christ. More unidentified persons enter the shot. In the background, the slasher begins to walk down the corridor, towards a commotion. Look at yourself first. You couldn't get him to the goddamn basement. Who? Who are you people? Can we get a medic on set, please? The slasher approaches D-1974. They halt suddenly and stare directly at the camera. Shit. We're going to need production and lighting back to reset this. Are they still on the lot? The camera begins to zoom in, focusing on 6733-1's face. As it zooms in, D-1974, Dr. Baines, and the unknown individuals are excluded from the frame. D-1974 off-screen. Where am I? Fifth unknown. Off screen. Cut, cut. 6733 1's face takes up the entirety of the shot. D1974 off screen. Where the hell am I? D1974 screams. The tape cuts to black. Afterward, the above transcript of SCP 6733's contents was created after the tape was watched by D1888 during a testing session overseen by Dr. Carpenter. There has never been an individual by the name of Malcolm Baines in Foundation employment. D-1888 has been placed in protective custody and is to be afforded maximum security. Item Number SCP-6112 
Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-6112 is to be kept in a standard video storage unit in the Media Archive of Site-18. Handling of SCP-6112 disks requires the use of a disposable latex glove to prevent exposure to fingerprints or smudges. An LCD television screen with an external DVD drive has been provided in Observational Theater 01, as well as equipment to record viewings. As a safety precaution, it is recommended for all personnel who feel unwell after viewing SCP-6112 to visit an on-site psychiatric facility for an evaluation. SCP-6112 is a standard DVD disc case containing a collection of the first two seasons of the popular American sitcom television series Seinfeld. The printed cover on the front has been entirely removed, exposing the black case and a piece of adhesive tape with the words 1 plus 2 written in felt-tip black pen. The Seinfeld has been written on an adhesive tape in an identical manner on the spine of the case. Despite claiming to contain multiple seasons of Seinfeld, the case only contains a single DVD disc. Upon inserting the SCP-6112 disc into a DVD player, the screen will load into a terminal screen. This screen is completely black, with bright red font, and contains no logos or images. Using the television remote, the user is able to select a specific episode from seasons 1 to 2 of Seinfeld through a drop-down menu. The only known methods of exiting the terminal screen are to either disconnect power to the monitor and DVD player, or to select an episode. The anomalous effects begin to manifest after the conclusion of the first scene in the episode, excluding the opening stand-up act performed by Jerry Seinfeld. The next scene will deviate heavily from the original episode script. The topics of these new scenes are significantly darker than the show's intended tone. Topics have ranged from embarrassing childhood memories to severe subjects like childhood trauma, domestic abuse, physical altercations, mental illness, and graphic violence. The characters in this scene will often discuss and mock the topic as if they have been in the situation themselves. Several of the show's actors and producers, including Jerry Seinfeld and Larry David, have denied ever participating in or writing the scenes shown in SCP-6112. SCP-6112 episodes are noticeably shorter than non-anomalous episodes of Seinfeld, running in at an average 7 minutes. An average episode runs at 22 minutes long. Unlike a standard episode of Steinfeld, there is no apparent B-plot. In the event that audience members watch the same episode again, it will play out completely different. Additionally, attempts to rewind or pause an episode have resulted in failure. Records show that no two episodes have ever been exactly the same. However. All recorded incidents of SCP-6112 scenes maintain a few consistent traits. The scenes will consist primarily of the show's main characters, Jerry Seinfeld, George Costanza, Elaine Bennis, and Cosmo Kramer. However, not every scene will contain every character. The setting of the scenes will almost always be limited to Jerry's apartment. In rare cases, the episodes will have scenes outside the apartment. The setting will always be nighttime. The scenes will feature no background music or sound effects, with the exception of the laugh track. The laugh track will play at seemingly random occurrences, regardless of whether there was humorous intent or even if there was anything happening on screen. The laugh track occasionally plays slower or faster, leading to the sound interlacing with a character's dialogue. The ending of every episode is similar. The final scene always ends with every living character leaving the room and closing the door, leaving the camera to record the empty apartment for up to 30 seconds while the credits play before abruptly being cut off. In the credits, the name associated with executive producer has been changed to one of the audience members' full names. The dialogue of the characters does not reflect the actual content of the show. Characters will make claims contradicted by other episodes as well as discuss events that have never occurred in any episode of Seinfeld. 
The episodes do not appear to correlate with each other chronologically, if at all. After analysis, SCP-6112 was deemed completely safe to view. Viewing of SCP-6112 did not result in any psychological changes or anomalous side effects in any recorded tests. Early testing of SCP-6112 episodes were viewed by several Foundation researchers. However, after the researcher reported Building Uncountable witnessing SCP-6112 episodes, several anonymous D-Class personnel were used as the audience instead. Addendum .6112 Episode Summaries Episode Summary September 3, 2007 George complains about an annoying neighbor to Jerry. Kramer enters the room, overhearing George's problem, and offers to help him frame the neighbor for cash and marijuana. George jokingly agrees, while Kramer takes the response seriously and acts upon it. George later admits the neighbor is an ex-girlfriend who took the apartment in order to spite George after being unfaithful to their relationship. The episode ends with George confronting Kramer for framing the neighbor, while Kramer denies ever participating in the plan. Episode Summary October 12, 2007 The entire episode consists of George sitting on the couch in Jerry's apartment and staring directly at the camera. Towards the end of the episode, Jerry enters and chastises George for wasting so much time watching television. George shoots Jerry out of the room and stares at the camera for roughly another minute before he picks up the remote and the recording cuts to static. Episode Summary October 16, 2007 Elaine tells Jerry and George an anecdote about how she was bullied in high school by a group of three girls. Elaine freezes mid-sentence and begins reciting the full name, date of birth, home address, phone number, and occupation of three individuals while in a trance-like state. Kramer enters and along with Jerry and George begins to insult Elaine with derogatory and sexist comments. After two minutes of this, Elaine picks up a metal bar and begins bludgeoning the other characters with it while they begin to scream. After knocking Jerry, George, and Kramer onto the ground, seemingly unconscious, Elaine drops the metal bar and sits on the couch while the other characters rise. All characters begin casually engaging in a conversation about a local Chinese restaurant, showing no recollection of the previous scene. Episode Summary November 15, 2007 Jerry and Elaine argue about the custody of a hypothetical child while George watches from off-screen. Jerry claims that he has not seen the child since the year 1971, while Elaine reveals that Jerry's alcoholism drove her to a mental breakdown, resulting in her keeping the child in New Jersey. A second Jerry enters the room with several empty glass bottles of beer and begins throwing them around the room leading the other characters to scream and attempt to hide behind furniture. The laugh track continues to play on loop, as the scene unfolds in the chaos, until a bottle shatters in George's face, knocking him onto the floor and splattering blood on the furniture. The second Jerry exits the scene as the remaining characters scream in horror. The laugh track continues to loop and appears to increase in volume and hysterics. Episode Summary January 17th 2008. Notably, this episode does not include a scene inside Jerry's apartment. The two characters, equipped with shovels, dig a large hole while discussing a variety of topics. Subjects of conversation include horror movies, celebrities, stalking, violence, human anatomy, prison, and breakfast cereals. Both George and Kramer are noticeably at unease, and George begins to sniffle around the five-minute point. At this point, neither character talks again. The episode cuts the footage from a camera zooming in on the second floor window of an unknown building. This scene lasts only for a few seconds before cutting back to the empty forest clearing for the remainder of the episode. What can be presumed to be George and Kramer's car is heard driving off at the end. Episode Summary February 2, 2008 Jerry is sitting alone in his apartment for several minutes before George, Kramer, and Elaine enter. The characters wander around the room while talking to each other, with the exception of Jerry. 
Jerry spends the remainder of the episode attempting to communicate with the other characters. However, the other characters appear to be completely aware of Jerry's presence in the room. After several minutes of failed attempts at conversation, Jerry lies down in the middle of the room and cries as the other characters laugh. At the end of the episode, the other characters leave Jerry crying on the floor. However, shortly after the exit, Jerry stands up and begins laughing hysterically to himself. Episode Summary February 11, 2008 This episode, for the majority, features no laugh track or any recognizable characters. The entire episode appears to have been recorded via dashcam footage. The first two minutes of the episode consist of driving through a straight road in a small town before stopping at a parking lot. The vehicle is idle for another minute as the driver, an obscured figure in the dark, exits the vehicle and walks off screen. The driver walks back into the vehicle with what appears to be two bottles of an unknown beverage. The remainder of the episode features the vehicle driving along the road for several minutes, frequently flashing with static and showing a new location. Notably, the car begins to frequently waver close to the middle yellow line. Halfway through the sixth minute, the car appears to drift off the road and hits an unknown figure before crashing into a pole. What can be presumed to be the driver can be seen running away from the scene and into the nearby forest as the video devolves into static. The static lasts for several seconds as what can be interpreted to be a warped, demonic laugh track plays. Immediately after, the episode cuts back to Jerry's empty apartment as the credits roll. No further testing has been attempted. Several other episodes of SCP-6112 were recorded, but were not included as they were deemed unfit for permanent documentation. Addendum .6112 Incident Log in a later test, an interaction between SCP-6112 and the audience was discovered accidentally. In the middle of a scene containing Jerry, Elaine, and Kramer, one of the audience members stood up and walked to a different part of the room for an extended period of time to avoid the television. Shortly after the subject broke focus with SCP-6112, the characters on screen abruptly ceased talking and stood frozen in silence for several seconds. Jerry, Elaine, and Kramer slowly rotated their heads to be staring directly at the camera. The character stayed frozen in its position until the audience member walked back to the television. Moments later, the characters simultaneously continued their scene from where they left off. The other two members of the same audience reported that they found the scene unnerving. These two subjects were unable to get the same result from SCP-6112 when they walked away from the television during that episode. Item number SCP-6697 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-6697-1 is to be kept in a standard containment locker at Site-59. Following the June 19, 2021 ruling of the Ethics Committee, a moratorium has been placed on further viewing of SCP-6697-1. If additional instances of SCP-6697 are recovered, there will be a maximum of five viewings beyond the non-anomalous series finale of each new instance for archival recording purposes. Research is ongoing to determine the best course of action to improve the welfare of its inhabitant. As such, non-anomalous recordings of individual episodes are available upon request. Proposals for improvement may be submitted to Director Nysmith. Description: SCP-6697 is the collective designation for the quote, Show Must Galwan unquote, series of video cassettes created by the Totlaysoft Corporation. Only one instance, SCP-6697-1, has been identified and contained, but promotional material from the SCP-2803 compound indicates that this cassette is a part of a larger series. SCP-6697-1, titled Cinefold, Sessions 1 through Infinity, is 23 minutes long. 
The first minute is a brief promotional segment from Totlysoft, including a frequently misspelled title card for the episode. The remainder of the video is an episode of Seinfeld. The episode in question changes with every complete viewing of the cassette, extending past the series finale and into a hypothetical and presumably infinite season 10. The maximum amount of new episodes is not known. The following is a summary from the tape's cover. Ah, Cinefold, the magnificent shoe about new things, entrancing Americans all throughout the USA. But when we come to end of Session 9, we ask, when Session 10? Foo! Where is Session 10? It cannot be over, oh grief. Wait no longer, Sanifold consumer. Like the Zangortlings of Buddhist marks, Totlysoft is extend have never-ending video technologies of heart-wrenching Dumlog Ovi into the ha-ha realm of comedy. Every episode is something new. See Jerry, Inlay, Gorg, and Grammar go on further adventures, occasionally saying ya da in other stupid words forever. Dick Lamers Due to many locked complaints about most noble and botable Totlysoft mastery of English largridge, you jerks, Totlysoft is being receptive of criticism and such, and haven't used powerfully tightly soft because computer algorithm to allocate characters of Cindy Ford to write dumb solves. Log of SCP-6697-1 Episodes Truncated Episode Number Title Summary 10-1 Recon Trashkin Upon their release from prison after the series finale, the cast attempt to rebuild their lives from the ground up, but they're short on cash. Newman wins $50 million in the lottery. Seeing his chance, Jerry attempts to bury the hatchet between them. This predictably fails. 10-3 Mon Mon After getting drunk in Vegas, Elaine wakes up to find out she had been married to an eccentric hippie known only as Moon Man. Elaine is unable to divorce Moon Man due to an unspecified redeeming quality that Elaine can only describe by slightly moving her palm back and forth and making a guttural whining noise. Moon Man is portrayed by Philip Seymour Hoffman, and he becomes a recurring character until his death in episode 10-174. 10-5 Grammar Dog Ovi Kramer inadvertently comes into possession of a large saltwater crocodile which he proceeds to name Russell, and tries to pass off as a dog. The self-writing narrative process repeats as normal until episode 10-7, Jerry's New Business, in which George Costanza begins to deviate from the narrative on his own. The exact point at which this deviation occurs is a scene of Monk's Cafe toward the midpoint in 10-7. Jerry. And then I told myself, why not? And look at me now. An entrepreneur. That is how you say it, by the way. I checked. George says nothing. He sits and stares at his coffee pensively. You know, you can tell me if you're jealous. No one's gonna come in and arrest you for it. George suddenly stands up. He places a $5 bill next to his coffee cup. George. Tell him to keep the change. What the? Jerry, I can't do this anymore. Goodbye. George leaves. Jerry briefly displays confusion, but then carries on his conversation with the place where George once sat. I mean, some people just hate the free market. Approximately seven seconds of silence. Whoa, slow your roll there, Stalin. The episode continues as normal, save for the absence of George. None of the characters, save for Jerry, notice his absence. They continue to act as if he is there. For example, at one point, Kramer passes George a cup of coffee, and it shatters on the ground. Kramer later pantomimes drinking said coffee. Episode Number Title Summary 10-8 Bible Stody Kramer and Newman try to become born-again Christians. George appears in another monk's coffee scene 
with the other three main characters. He's agitated and confused, demanding to know how he got there in the first place. George's comments are ignored completely. He is absent from all subsequent scenes. 10-9 Il Mon Mon Moon Man inadvertently lands a leading role in Bertie's Il Trovatore at the Met. George appears only briefly in a scene in Jerry's apartment. The scene consists of George looking around, yelling, The fuck! I just want to leave! and running away. 10-10 Prince Charming The original plot of this episode is unclear. The closest estimation is that Jerry and George try a new dating strategy in which they claim to be a part of the extended royal family of Liechtenstein. The original plot of episode 10-10 is significantly altered by the opening scene of Monk's Cafe. As George sits at the booth, he holds his hands in the air, as if holding a steering wheel. Jerry. So let's go over the plan again. I'll say that I'm… George. I was driving. Duke Reifhauser. I don't know, too Nazi? George. Interrupting the laugh track. Jerry. I was driving. Just now. Why am I here? So are we going to go over the… No. No we are not. I was on I-87 a few seconds ago. Audra was in the passenger seat. We were… God damn it, where's Audra? Okay, uh… This is where you tell me who Audra is. My fiance. You're getting married? Yes. And you didn't tell me? Yeah, I didn't, because I want nothing to do with you anymore. Jerry looks at him with exaggerated doubt. Take me back. Now. Okay. There's no way I can really Harold Pinter the subtext out of this, so… Is this you telling me how bad the plan is by avoiding it, or… Shut your mouth and take me back to my car. Okay, but… The random teleports to your apartment were one thing. But I was in a moving car. Audra could… They're suddenly cut off by the bass riff of a scene transition. Later in the episode, in what's supposed to be the double date scene at a fancy restaurant, George is not present in the booth with Jerry and her dates. Instead, he can be heard sobbing deeply into a payphone from the restroom corridor. Episode Number Title Summary 10-11 Total Eclipse Elaine and Moon Man have a falling out over whether or not the coming solar eclipse will have supernatural ramifications. George only appears in a single scene in Jerry's apartment. George is wearing a tuxedo. He accuses Jerry of teleporting him out of Audra's funeral and physically assaults him. 10-22 Best Divorce 2 A holiday special. George's father introduces the gritty reboot of Best of Us known as Best of Us 2. This episode marks the beginning of a 54-episode period in which George is present for all of his scenes but refuses to speak. 10-76 Jerry the Janissary Having decided that he doesn't want children, Jerry tries to get a low-cost vasectomy from a mob doctor. George speaks again in another Monk's Cafe scene, but only to say, Hey Jerry, watch this. He proceeds to pour his hot coffee into the lap of a man in the next booth. The man does not react or even acknowledge his injury. Jerry demands that George never do this again. George smiles. In Episode 10-77, Operation Soup Valkyrie, this exchange occurs. George and Jerry are standing in a long line outside Soup Nazi's restaurant. I heard something about the order routine being changed up. Whenever I'm with you, nobody reacts to anything I do. I heard something about the ordering routine being… so, no one can hold me accountable. Do what you're meant to do, and they'll react, I promise! And you still haven't explained that. I physically cannot. Just pretend nothing weird is going on. Act like you used to. Like, get into soup mode. As George looks away, Jerry glances worriedly to the sky and mouths, I'm sorry, Mr. Gok. I don't know why he keeps doing this. George pulls out a pistol from his jacket and cuts the line. No! Fuck it. Making the most of it. He enters the restaurant and goes behind the counter. Laughing wildly, he shoots Soup Nazi seven times at point-blank. Neither Soup Nazi nor the customers acknowledges. 
No pulse for you. Soup Nazi lies dead. George messily devours a fistful of broccoli cheddar soup, straight from the pot. The only sounds heard are an incorrectly timed laugh track, and Jerry screams of horror. Episodes 10-77 through 10-173 follow a similar pattern. An ordinary episode is interrupted by George going on a crime spree that only Jerry notices. Every recurring character that George murders inexplicably comes back to life in another episode. For example, Soup Nazi returns in 10-124, titled Soup is Risen. By the end of episode 10-173, George has murdered every other named character but Jerry at least once. Episode 10-174, The Keystone, ends prematurely in the following scene. Jerry emerges from his bedroom. Kramer sits on the floor outside. Jerry. What are you doing here? Kramer. I took up lockpicking. I mean, on the floor. Just thought I'd try it with your door. I think I won. Okay, but why are you on the… George's hand suddenly emerges from the bedroom door. He pulls Jerry back in and slams it shut behind him. Kramer continues acting off on an invisible Jerry. The following conversation is heard muffled behind the bedroom door. George, why is Newman alive? George, listen to me. I lit him on fire. We both saw him burn to ashes. Why is he alive? Why did you even have to kill him in the first place? It's the only source of serotonin I have left. Now answer my question. This isn't what Audra would have… A gunshot. Jerry screams. You don't get to say her name. You're the reason she's dead. Fuck's sakes, Jerry. I was just about to turn my life around. Why didn't she come back, huh? She wasn't relevant to the story. Is that why you killed her? I didn't kill her. Then who did? No one. You didn't teleport out of that car. It's not a teleport, it's just… look. It's like a starting point. Like the ghost square on Monopoly. Whenever something interesting happens, you naturally show up. I really wish I could explain it more than that, but… look. What do you know about Totlysoft? I'm going to give you five more seconds to say something that makes any sense at all. No, 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 you don't want this. I'm the one guy you can't kill. My last name is the title of the… Zero. Another gunshot. Kramer suddenly melts into a puddle of viscous black sludge. Cut to black. From this point on, the title of the show changes to Costanza. George is the only character who hasn't dissolved into oil. Unlike previous episodes, the laugh tracks have completely synchronized with George's actions. Episode number, title. Summary 10-175 The Omeg George George silently wanders the empty streets of New York City, searching for survivors. 10-180 Table for One George spends the entirety of the episode quietly weeping in a booth of the dilapidated Monk's Cafe. 10-195 Bye, George The episode lasts 12 seconds. It abruptly ends when George shoots himself. 10-196 Hi, George. George reappears in Jerry's apartment, alive and well. After a brief nervous breakdown, he jumps out the window to attempt suicide again. 10-197 Hi again, George. Similar content to 10-196, but he attempts to shoot himself while falling. 10-254 The Long and Winding Road He begins a 104-episode story arc of making a journey on foot to other cities to find survivors of the 10-174 event. He is unsuccessful. 10-358 Tamandus of King George Having given up his journey, he enters the ruins of Holy Name Cathedral in downtown Chicago. George kneels at the altar. He makes the sign of the cross. Okay, God? I think I get the point. This is my eternal damnation, isn't it? Or at least some kind of purgatory? That's the only thing that makes sense. I'll be the first to admit that I've been a selfish sack of shit all my life. 
I probably deserve worse. But that's why I tried to leave Jerry and the others in the first place. Did I start too late? But I'm not waking up at Jerry's place anymore. Which means there's a way that all this can change. I realize you probably got a whole mess of god shit to take care of right now. I probably backed up the line to the pearly gates around several blocks, right? Yeah. Too soon. Sorry. So I better cut to the chase. Can I have a sign? Something to indicate? An angelic chorus suddenly swells up. A soft white light posts through the ruined ceiling, landing on George's face. Laugh track. George's eyes widen. This is the first time he's able to hear the sound. Is that a fucking laugh track? Episode 10-359 titled, George's Quest to Get Off the Airs, Part 1, begins with George stripping naked and writing, Am I Inappropriate Yet? on the wall of the cathedral with his own beasties. Amid repeated cries of censor me, stop watching this, and let me die, he captures, tortures, and mutilates several opossums. At the time of the testing moratorium, the last recorded iteration was George's Quest to Get Off of the Airs, Part 126.